Hey, number 10. Hope you guys had a fantastic weekend. A lot to get into over the course of today's show. A fun one we have prepared for you here on 104.5 The Zone. Lucas Panzeca is here. Well, he's not here. He's back at the studio. I am here. And Jeffrey Simmons, Titans defensive tackle, will be here at 11.15. Stick around. I'm sure Big Jeff's going to have a lot to say. You guys want to get involved? 615-737-1045 is the number. 615-737-1045. We're going to talk about the Pro Football Hall of Fame induction ceremony last night. The Music City Grand Prix was a great time as well. And then, of course, Titans training camp discussion all throughout the course of the day. Now, I saw about 10 minutes of practice, if that, because they started at 945 today. Uh, But for our purposes... Our purposes, they are practicing right in front of me. So I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to tell you. In fact, I can tell you right now that Julio Jones and A.J. Brown are not here. They are working out on the bike. Uh, and they have put out the team an unofficial depth chart for the Titans today. They were handing out handing out copies of it when I walked into the building. And one of the PR people, the great the great Dwight Spradlin, walked over, handed this to me, Lucas, and said, you know, let's oh, you printed one out. Look at you. <laughs> Schaefer did. Schaefer did. I had a play. Look at you guys actually doing the good work of producers. Uh, so the unofficial depth chart is out. Lucas, I guess, uh, is there anything that caught your eye initially? Because there are a handful of things, three in particular, that uh, that popped out to me. If you can, if you want to check out the first unofficial depth chart of the 2021 season, by the way, you can do so at Buck Rising. I tweeted it out right before I sat down. Anything catch your eye, bud? Uh, Dylan Radens. Slotted in right behind Nate Davis. Doesn't look like he's in there behind one of the tackle spots. That's the first thing I see. Indeed. Your starting right tackle, if the season started today, according to the unofficial depth chart, is not Kendall Lamb. It's Ty Sambrello. So you have Ty Sambrello as the starting right tackle right now. You have Dylan Radens as a guard, the backup right guard behind Nate Davis. Elsewhere on the depth chart, Tucker McCann is the kicker. Sam Ficken, his backup. And Chester Rogers returning punts, followed by Cam Batson, Mason Kinsey. So the competition at wide receiver will become interesting with those names, those kind of special teams obligations that those kind of guys are assigned to make sure that they have multiple uses to justify a fifth or sixth wide receiver slot when the roster is pared down. Elsewhere, I guess the only thing that I would say is that Jeff Swain right. is the starting tight end. <laughs> I was about to say that. Jeff Swain, who is not who has not practiced in God knows how long. So I think I think they're just bleeping with us a little bit. <laughs> I, th- I think they're just ficking with us a little bit. If I can uh, if I can use the punter's last name as a pun. I think we can get away with that. The can we get away with that? No, I don't think but this is not like this is not like Don Davenport on three HL and Shiano for the right. S word. I feel like Ficken is too close. It's too close. It's and like, I feel like, like I'm, you're saying it with an accent. Right. And Dawn, Dawn is much more composed than I am. So if there was one of us to let it slip, well, Mickey, it would absolutely be me. Mickey, like if I if I was to say that that, uh, you know, in uh, just for example, this is not something that's happening in front of me right now for any Titans people who would come after me and say this is not within the bounds of the reporting. But if I was to say. You know, Darrington Evans on a zone right run was absolutely ficked by Jeffrey Simmons. I feel like I might trip over that. I'm scared. That's an easy trap to fall into. Mickey Ryan wanted to put together when it was Blake Hobbiel, Blake, and Tucker McCann. He was calling them Blucker. Uh, you, no. you can't do that here with with Ficken and, and Tucker McCann. It's a dangerous. This is the most dangerous of games. Playing with names on live radio when there are FCC sanctions uh, involved. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. Before we, I, I want to talk about Eddie George and Steve McNair today because that is perpetually among Titans fans two names that come to mind any time we have the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Those are two of the greatest players, if not the two greatest players in the history of the franchise, the two most famous players in the history of the franchise so far, at least during their time in Tennessee. Houston Oilers is a different conversation, of course. But with Peyton May, I want to start before we get to Eddie and Steve, because I have a really good conversation prepared for you. We have a really good conversation prepared for you as to who would make the better case 
for Hall of Fame induction between Steve McNair and Eddie George and why neither of them are probably going to get there. 615-737-1045. But I want to start with Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning, of course, one of the members of the 2021 class inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame first ballot. Surprise to no one. Tom Brady in attendance, a future first ballot Hall of Famer. When it is Tom's time, Peyton made jokes about retiring in 2025 and that being the situation. Ooh, now this is this is interesting because I have one-on-ones in front of me, Lucas, and I believe we can report on this. So this is going to be live play-by-play out here from St. Thomas Sports Park, except instead of Julio Jones and A.J. Brown, it's Cam Batson and NWI. Can we get Kirby on the color, Mike? <laughs> no, we cannot. <laughs> you want to talk about things you got to protect ourselves against? <laughs> got to protect ourselves against Kirby, Allen Kirby, who is out here today. I could... I'm, I'm more more happy to see Kirby than I am any human being ever. And for me to say that about Kirby, Allen Kirby, you know how I had to be down bad the past couple of weeks. 615-737-1045. So with Peyton Manning going in yesterday, I felt like the conversation around him was conflicted. I felt like Titans fans who have hated that man for all of the things he did to this franchise during so many years in the AFC Central and then the AFC South as the quarterback for the Indianapolis Colts, they have strong feelings about him. But, of course, the larger fan base, the more vocal fan base, is that of the Tennessee Volunteers, which every time they do anything, whether it be football, baseball, basketball, swimming, anything, that they want to celebrate the University of Tennessee, who do they trot out there? Number 16, Peyton Manning. The most famous is he is he the most famous Tennessee alumni? He would he would have to be right. Yeah, like I, I can't think of a close second. No, yes, it, it would be Peyton Manning. There's a reason why he's in every University of Tennessee commercial. Yeah. So if if you're about branding, you're about Manning, which has basically been his entire career. And he stuck to form yesterday during his induction ceremony uh, when he talked about a great many things, but more than anything, yesterday for the at the podium for Peyton Manning felt like a campaign. Did it not? It, yeah. I, I don't know if he was straight up running for president, but he was sure as hell uh, running for something. Because it could have been anything. He, the way he talked about cultivating the game made it feel like to me that Peyton Manning was auditioning to be the next NFL commissioner. This was Peyton Manning yesterday. Now, when we leave this stage tonight, it is no longer about us. It is about cultivating the game that has given so much to us. It's about nurturing football to live and thrive another day, another year, decade, and another generation. It's about guaranteeing that kids everywhere can learn, bond, grow, and have fun with every flag pulled, every tackle made, every pass thrown, every run, block, sack, and touchdown scored. The audience here tonight is made up of diehard fans who feel football deep in your bones. Now, we may have ignited the fire, but you, you have fanned the flames. Inevitably, those flames will be whipped by the winds of change, but they don't need to smolder. The future of this game is ours to shape. We just need to take tomorrow on our shoulders as readily as we donned our pads before each game. Let this moment become a cherished memory. And then remember, a legacy is only worthwhile when there is a future to fuel. God bless you, and God bless football. God bless you, and God bless football. Peyton Manning at the podium for his Pro Football Hall of Fame induction yesterday. I, I mean, come on. Tell me, tell me, tell me Peyton wouldn't win any election. It doesn't matter what, for what party, for what office. Tell me Peyton Manning wouldn't win in a landslide. Yeah, that, that could have been for president, for senator, for commissioner, for sheriff. That could have been for absolutely anything. Just use that speech. Talk about it, football in your, uh, in your acceptance speech or campaign speech for whatever you're running for. God bless you and God bless football. That is absolutely something. That is absolutely the Peyton Manning platform. 615-737. 1045 hashtag whatever Peyton Manning but I like I feel like there was there was a segment I mean the entire state of Tennessee roots for Peyton Manning right like even even the die the most die hard of Titans fans who hated him for so many years given that he would come back to the state uh, uh where he was most famous for and come back and disrespect this franchise in a great many ways I got I got Matt Barkley throwing footballs over here at me by the way we're right in front of the end zone Kirby Allen Kirby is playing pitch and catch basically with Matt Barkley. He's you can see him on Zone TV. In fact, he just went to retrieve the ball. Uh, so we're going to have fun out here today. But Peyton, Peyton Manning, um, if he won't go into the television booth, 
he has to find some kind of administrative role, right? Uh, Bleacher Report wrote a, a really in-depth piece about how much influence Peyton Manning post-football has over the NFL, over hirings, over firings, over business decisions, because he, as good as he was at playing quarterback, and as much as he revolutionized the game, he sure as hell revolutionized marketing for athletes. I mean, when you talk about the only... I, TB12 is one thing. Jordan Brand is in an entirely different stratosphere. But Peyton understanding the marketplace as a professional athlete and his value, I think, has skyrocketed him in terms of public perception, where Peyton Manning had this landscape figured out. And also, he changed how quarterback was played, right? Nobody was audibling at the line of scrimmage the way that Peyton Manning was doing it. Now you see every quarterback who's worth a damn out here changing plays at the line of scrimmage, operating um, operating in the two-minute, operating in the no-huddle, things that Peyton Manning really brought to the game and then revolutionized. Now, nobody has done it outside of Brady and maybe Rodgers and guys who can overwhelm with physical ability. Nobody's done it at the level that Peyton did. So from that standpoint, you cannot write the history of the NFL without Peyton. Lonzo Wright on YouTube writes in, I don't care about Peyton Manning. Well, there, so we found the one. We found the one guy, 615-737. 1045. But coming up next, you know, Peyton Manning, no doubter. Charles Woodson, no doubter. You you saw a great many. Calvin Johnson, who is the first, one of the few, uh, one of the first players, 35 or younger, to go into the NFL Hall of Fame. Calvin jo- Johnson inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Many other great names across the history of the sport as well. But two names that continue to be brought up, particularly yesterday, with Edron James going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Steve McNair and Eddie George, are they, do they have legitimate cases to be Hall of Fame inductees? They are two guys whose numbers are retired. Number 9 and 27 hang in, I, I guess you can't call them the rafters, but they hang at the very top of Nissan Stadium on those in the Ring of Honor, which is largely just a bunch of billboards. But they are two, if not the most famous players in the history of this franchise since coming to Tennessee I don't know who else you could make the case for. Ultimately, they are still people who get left on the outside looking in. And I want to have this conversation with the audience coming up next. Who has the better case for the Pro Football Hall of Fame? 615-737-1045. Who has the better case among these two Titans great? Is it Eddie George or is it Steve McNair? We'll get to that coming up next. But first, we want to go to Susie, who's in Chattanooga. And done like Peyton Manning. What's up, Susie? Hello, Susie. Hello. You're on the air. Susie, what you got for me? Hi. I just wanted to disagree. I am not, I do not like Peyton Manning whatsoever. I'm a Vols fan. I'm a Titans fan. And when there was talk about Peyton coming to Tennessee, I was trying, how do I like this man after all of these years I've just liked him so much and I just yeah he was good but <laughs> he wasn't my, I'm a titan and I don't have I don't like him at all no Susie I, I don't think you're alone and and honestly and I appreciate the honesty 615-737-1045 are you are you a fan of Peyton Manning if you're a titans fan I don't know that that's the case. Susie's speaking for a lot of people. Maybe maybe no one as brave as Susie that's willing to come on the air and say it, but Susie definitely leading off the building. So we'll come back. We'll react to that on the other side. If you want to weigh in on the Steve McNair, Eddie George conversation about the Pro Football Hall of Fame, you can do that as well, 615-737-1045. All that and more coming up next. I'm Buck Rising, and this is 104.5 The Zone. Coming up today on Blaine and Mickey. Who is your ding-dong of the week? Well, we'll show you ours, oh. presented by Mark Spain Real Estate. <laughs> and Luke Worsham, he's no ding-dong of A to Z Sports. He gives us a Titans training camp report with all the latest news. Today, starting at 1 p.m. on 104.5 The Zone. Buck Rising back with you. My good friend Gary Ashton recently told me that people walk up to him all the time and say, don't sell without the intel. That's because it's true. Now is a fantastic time to sell in Nashville, but you can't do it without the Intel. And no one has better Intel than the Gary Ashton team. Intel so that you can sell your house without any showings or staging. 
intel on where to find your next home so you can sell your current one while the market is still red hot. Intel that helps you win the buyer battle and cash in on your home equity right now. Everyone else is getting the same information and competing for the same properties. GaryAshton.com gives you the edge with the best real estate intel in Nashville. Plus, the Gary Ashton team is the official real estate agent of the Tennessee Titans. Get the confidence to sell your home without the stress and with time to find your dream address by calling the Gary Ashton team with Remax Advantage today at 615-301-1650 or visit GaryAshton.com. Remember, don't sell without the intel. Switching your car insurance to GEICO is both easy and could save you hundreds. It's the best of both worlds. Like a corgi who does household chores. A chorgi. Who's a good chorgi? Look at those carpet lines. You're the good chorgi. Yes, you are. The carpet is perfect. Geico. Easy and savings. The best of both worlds. voucher and maximum tax deduction.
we were uh, we were talking about things that you do for a significant other's birthday during the commercial break because it is now I don't Lucas how do I do this properly because I don't know if I should give away her age but it's my girlfriend Dara's birthday today so do I say a happy whatever birthday or do I just ignore the age uh I'm gonna let you make the decision because it's your ass if it's wrong <laughs> exactly right 615-737-1045 so a very happy birthday to uh the love of my life dara epstein and happy birthday to him i don't care good luck you're out of practice you're supposed to fade it down when it says him and say her (laughs) you blew it 615-737-1045 so happy birthday to dara uh we were talking about peyton manning Susie expressed her displeasure as a Titans fan from Chattanooga with Peyton Manning. She couldn't even get herself to wrap. She couldn't even wrap her head around the idea that when Peyton Manning was potentially interested in the Titans and then, you know, Jeff Fisher had him work out with Mark Mariani. And I love Mark to death, but that's not who you trot out there when Peyton Manning comes to town for a workout. So Susie was saying even when Peyton Manning was potentially considering coming to the Titans that she still hated him, even though she's a Tennessee Volunteers fan. 615-737-1045. 615-737-1045. Lucas, you said we had Darius on the line, so let's go to Darius, who leads us off in this segment. What's up, Darius? What's up, Buck? How you doing? Can you hear me? I got you. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, got you. Okay, so I was wanting to uh, talk about the potential of Steve and Eddie getting in. Uh, sure. Now, what I was thinking is they probably won't get on the modern era ba- uh, ballot, but probably in about 10 to 15 years, do you think there's a chance that they can get in on the legacy or the centennial ballot? Because, you know, there were a couple of names who got in this weekend on the centennial ballot or like the legacy ballot. So I wanted to see your perspective on them not getting in potentially on the modern era ballot, but on the centennial ballot, which I think they have a better chance because those are for the players who, you know, who are kind of forgotten in history, quote unquote. Um, But I think they have a chance for that instead of the modern era. So I'll hang up and listen. No, Darius, I think that's that's the best potential argument for either of them to be able to get in is on that legacy ballot, on that centennial ballot. Well, I guess it's not centennial because we're past the 100-year mark of the NFL. But what he's saying there is so. Steve, Steve McNair and Eddie George, and, and I'd be curious to hear if the audience, if the, if the rest of the audience disagrees with what was uh, with what was said by Darius, it, that they, they can get into the Hall of Fame, Steve McNair and Eddie George, on their own merits or if they do require this legacy ballot to be able to get in retroactively after their modern day selections uh after the timeline expires for that and i think that's the best possible chance for either of them because the way the way that i have this conversation and you know myself obviously not a pro football hall of fame voter but the way that I was kind of having this conversation with myself last night watching, because Edron James sparked this conversation. Edron James, Eddie George, uh, uh, what do you, I mean, you call them peers to a degree given the position that they played and the timeline that they did both play. But I think ultimately you have to have the conversation this way. Were they the best at their positions, running back and quarterback? Were they the top of their class, the, the, best, in, the best in their era, during the time that they played. And you would look at McNair's co-MVP that year with Peyton Manning, and I know many Titans fans are very quick to discount that particular MVP for Peyton Manning, saying I think he has three and a half as opposed to four because he splits that one with McNair. But when it comes down to Steve McNair, you cannot make the argument that he was the best at his position, that he was the best player of his era at quarterback. Nobody, nobody is going to call in today. Nobody is going to weigh in today with that discussion. Then you look at Eddie George, and you say, okay, well, was Eddie the best running back of his era during the time that he played? And he was among the best. Certainly, Eddie, I think, has helped himself so much in the public view because he's still, I mean, you would argue, you would argue that Eddie George is still the most recognizable member of the Tennessee Titans franchise across any any era at this point. North of 20 years playing in Tennessee. Not talking about the Houston Oilers because I'm not diminishing the greats that came before Eddie and Steven. Both, of course, played for the Houston Oilers and made that transition from Texas to Tennessee much, much easier. There is no disputing that. 
These are still two fantastic, out-of-this-world players. But Eddie was not the greatest at, at his position going in uh, g- during the era that he played. He was among them. But when you look at, like, Edron James, the argument for Edron James kind of goes away when you look at, well, I mean, for starters – Edron James averaged almost a full half yard a carry more than Eddie George across their careers. Eddie topping four yards a carry was not something that he was ever able to accomplish. It was the literal definition of three yards in a cloud of dust is the way that that Titans offense worked. Out of the backfield, it's not even comparable between Edron James and Eddie George. These are two different kind of players, but this is what, no pun intended, gives Edron James the edge over Eddie George. So if you're talking about the best case for them to make the Hall of Fame, either of them, I think Darius is so spot on to say that the legacy ballot is probably the best option to go with or the best chance for these two to be able to get in. Because at this point, I'm looking at the guys that are passing them by and I'm saying, well, there's just, you know, they're going to continue to fade at this point. It's not like the it's not like the memory of them is going to last as you continue to see these greats and we get into different eras of football where we're talking about the Peyton Mannings and the Calvin Johnsons and and, and, one would imagine soon uh, soon to come Tom Brady or Ray Lewis. Like these, these two in particular, these guys are going to start to lose whatever national luster they might have as far as pro football, potential pro football Hall of Fame inductees go at least by the national consciousness, right? Because it's not just, you know, it's not just a group of Titans media that makes the argument for them to go into the Hall of Fame. No, it's a collection of NFL writers and media members across the decades who are stewards of the game, who are historians of the game. And they are who debates this during the selection process before the nominees are announced. 615-737-1045. Darrington uh, says that Steve and Eddie are not Hall of Famers. No way, in fact. What's up, Darrington? What's going on, Mr. Buss? How are we doing today? Man, we are doing just fine. Wonderful, wonderful. Man, look at man, I've been in Cincinnati all my life. And I can tell you, man, I love Stephen A. and Ed George and what they do for the city and what they say. But that's about it, man. When it comes to the football field, last time I checked, Jeff Fisher was still their head coach. So I'm pretty sure they, that, that qualifies for nothing. I mean, you can go to the Hall of Fame of Very Good, if there's a category for that, then yeah, automatic. Stephen, their first ballot. Eddie George may be a second ballot of, of just being very good, man. He was great in college. It just didn't, to me, it just didn't transcend over into the pros. Uh, just watching and looking at his numbers. Hell, if Sterling Sharp can't make it to the Hall of Fame, I don't see how Eddie George and Steve McNair can. All right, Buck, man. You have a good one, man. Enjoy that field. Man, thank you, Darrington. I will. They are in front of me today. It's a beautiful day out at St. Thomas Sports Park, but the sun is starting to come out, and now this is where we die for the next <laughs> for the next two and a half, two and a half hours. Don't forget Jeffrey Simmons, Titans interior defensive lineman, going to join us probably about eleven thirty, given the practice was pushed back about fifteen minutes today. So I, I mean, I think I think many people, many rational people, I'm sure there are diehard Titans fans who are listening to this and who are offended by the idea that we would be. I don't want to say that we're diminishing. We're just trying to have a rational argument about Steve and Eddie, right? So I just ultimately think, for from my perspective, once you get past the numbers, because the numbers is the first thing, right? The first thing you do is you're going to remember their style of play, remember the kind of teams that they played on, remember how far those teams made, made it. Were they championship teams? How far, if not, did they advance throughout the course of the postseason during the time that they played, and how often were they a fixture? in the postseason then outside of that you have the legacy conversation about whether you can write the history of the nfl with with or without including these players that you're talking about you cannot write the history of football without peyton manning you cannot write the history of football without people like tom flores who was great yesterday all all the speeches yesterday were re- are in over the course of the past two days were really really good by the way and and closing with charles woodson initially i didn't agree with it because charles was the uh i mean of the players who went in peyton manning is the most famous right but then charles woodson absolutely knocked it out of the park he killed it he was singing boys to men on the podium in front of god knows how many people in canton ohio it was a really really cool scene but can you write the history of the nfl without Steve McNair and Eddie George. I don't think you can just because, for no other reason, 
One, they are, well, at least Steve is, responsible, partly responsible for one of the most famous plays in NFL history, right? Kevin Dyson extending that arm, trying to reach the end zone in the Super Bowl against the Rams and coming up just short. With Eddie, he continues to be a transcendent figure off the field and was a transcendent figure on the field, but how much of that is just post-career? How much of how much of that is the fact that he's been so spectacular at diversifying himself after football, becoming a businessman, becoming a college football head coach? There are so many things that Eddie George has done that make him a spectacular advocate for football, after football. And Eddie was a great advocate for football while during his career as well. I'm just talking about how much the optics have changed since these guys have been out of the league. 615 737 1045. Jason is in Virginia. He wants to talk about Steve and Eddie. What's up, Jason? Yeah, I think Steve uh, McNair has probably got a better shot of getting in than Eddie George. You know, uh, as much as I love Eddie George, he's probably the third best Titans running back, maybe even fourth if you look at um, when they're in Houston. Never rushed for 2,000 yards. You got to put him behind Chris Johnson and definitely Derrick Henry. So, so, okay. So, is it just because Eddie is maybe could be the third best running back by the time it's all said and done, or is it, or is is there something that Steve has that puts him over the top for you? Well, Steve was the franchise's best quarterback, so I think at that position, he's probably got the best chance of getting to the Hall of Fame. No, I think I, I think that's. Uh, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna keep your argument concise, that's absolutely something that you would look at. But again. Outside of the outside of the, it can't just be that he was the best quarterback in the franchise's history because he's not. By the way, if you're talking about the franchise's history, you're going to go Warren Moon with the Houston Oilers because that has to be a part of their history, right? He's the best quarterback in Titans history during the Titans era. The last what 23 years is it uh, since they arrived in Tennessee? But Warren Moon is the best quarterback in the franchise itself's history. The Houston Oilers, and then the transformation into the Tennessee Oilers, and then ultimately the Tennessee Titans. 615-737-1045. Michael is in Nashville. He wants to weigh in. What's up, Michael? Hey, Buck. How you doing today, man? Man, we're doing great. All right, so two things. First, uh, happy birthday to your girlfriend. Uh, how long y'all been you. together? Uh, be just over two years this past April. Thank you for that. All right. And next thing on the uh, Steve and Eddie thing, I think Steve – has the better chance of getting into the Hall of Fame just based off of his play style, where if you look at the history of quarterbacks, he was probably one of the first, other than Steve Young at the dual threat position. And then secondly, I think if the NFL was to come up with the war, like the wins above replacement, like yeah. the MLB does for their Hall of Fame, if they was to come up with that, Steve would have a better shot of getting in based off his position because Eddie – would be compared to guys like, you know, Gail Sayers and Barry Sanders and people like that that are already there. No, I think that's a – and and it'd be curious to see the way that advanced analytics change the math. Thank you for the call, Michael. 615-737-1045 is the number. 615-737-1045. Football's been kind of slow to this, right? Advanced metrics and how they change the evaluation of the players that come into the league. Now, it's certainly made up some ground, and given that it's a multi-billion dollar industry, I'm sure it'll be light years ahead by the time everything kind of levels out. But baseball has always been on the forefront of the math and how it changes how you view the players down to how front offices in baseball do the evaluation of the talent that they bring in, the talent that they sign, the talent that they play on any given day. Steve, can we can we make up our own category to put in the box scores? Like, uh, gut, gutty win percentage, gritty win percentage for all the stuff that Steve McNair famously played through and all the accomplishments that he was able to have despite being, you know, it seems doing half of half of his career in an arm sling at various points or uh, uh, fractured, fractured God knows what. I, 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 the, the list of, of Steve McNair injuries is legendary, and that's something that people would always hold somebody like Marcus Mariota to that standard, right, and be like, well, McNair played through it. Why can't Marcus? That was always a conversation that hovered over Marcus Mariota during his time here in Tennessee. 615-737-1045. I, I, I think ultimately that Darius has had it the most right so far. Darius, who called in earlier and said that the legacy ballot for these two guys 
is is both of their best chance to get in. You can make the argument for one or the other as to who has the best case, but ultimately I think they both fall short when you're talking about modern era players because the the, the definition of modern era is slowly, I mean, not that slowly. It's pretty rapidly eluding them as they get further and further away from their playing day. 615-737-1045. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation about the Hall of Fame because they put out yesterday after the festivities concluded that they a, a list of names that are first ballot NFL players or guys who are eligible now that the five year five years since retiring period has re, uh, has expired for them. I got a list of let's say seven guys, seven guys who should be first ballot NFL Hall of Famers. On the other side, and I'd be curious to hear what the audience thinks of them. 615-737-1045. If you want to jump in on the conversation, don't forget, in an hour, just a little under an hour from now, Jeffrey Simmons will sit down with us because we're live at Titans Training Camp where we'll be doing the show all week long. And by the way, it's game week. It's preseason game number one. That's got to be very exciting as Amy Wells of Titans Radio struts in front of the tent. She's ready to go. Rep Brian, Coach Mack, Mike Keith, and you can hear it all on Friday. On 104.5 The Zone. Going to be a great time getting the thumbs up from uh, from Amy Wells. you love to see it. We'll come back and we'll talk about who's going to be eligible next year for the Hall of Fame. And we'll continue the coverage of Titans Training Camp live, courtesy of our friends at Two Rivers Ford. Powered by Ford, driven by people. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. This is where the Titans play. Right. 104.5 The Zone.
Yes. <laughs> I'm the Mickey of Blaine and Mickey. That's correct. Yes. It's now now not only has it been a minute since I've seen you physically in person, but uh it's just it's just lovely to see you out here decked out in everything that could cover up literally every inch of skin on your body to protect your translucent ass from the sun. This is incredible. It's hard to stay clear, Buck. It's hard (laughs) to stay clear, but I managed to do it now for for years. So uh, this is the result of driving a 4020 John Deere with no cab for all of my childhood and just baking in the sun. I have the dermatologist on speed dial. She tells me to wear a lot of clothes. On speed, though. Yeah. I got I got some I got some SBF forty five in my bag, Mick. We'll we'll slather you in it. Maybe we'll no. put it on social, get erotic later. Forty five? Are you kidding me? I, <laughs> I have SPF ten shed, where it's basically like putting a shed over your body while you walk around. <laughs> oh, Mickey Ryan here with us at Mickey Ryan one oh four five is where you can follow him, of course. Uh so Mick, you are back out here at Titans Practice. You've been out here for a couple of days. What have your observations been? What have you learned? In, in two days. It basically, it, it's like you're trying to play detective. Like, everybody else has said all this stuff, so you want to come and see it for yourself. Um, I think the first thing that stood out to me is everybody's talked about what Caleb Farley looks like. Yes. Just like, okay, that's what a number one NFL cornerback, that's just what they look like now. So seeing him up close for the first time, I was like, okay, I'm going to check. That. Yep, oh, that's all true. It's all true. Uh, another guy that we've heard a lot about, who's a great story, and every NFL team has them, is Tier Tart. And he made a, a, a great play just now in team drills. And I just looked at him. like he's. Brables talks a lot about him in the offseason. Mm-hmm. He got one of the awards, I think, the offseason awards, which doesn't always mean anything because some of those guys don't make the team, and, and some of them do as role players or whatever. But uh, he looks like a different dude. Just looks like a completely different dude. So I'm, I'm impressed by him. And here's the thing, Buck, on the defensive line, all hands on deck. They need tear tart and big merch. Like all those dudes need to play well. I'm super happy about Danico Autry. That might be my favorite free agent acquisition they made. But he needs he he and Big Jeff need other dudes behind them. Okay, now wait. You're gonna have to expand on that because of all the shiny new toys that they have. Interior defensive lineman from Indianapolis is not where I think most people would go with their favorite free agent signing. Why is that the case for you? Well, if you listen to Blaine and Mickey, Blaine Bishop who is a 10-year NFL veteran, says a lot. That's the shortest path to the quarterback is right at the middle of the field. Yes. And if that rascal can get to the quarterback first, because Big Jeff's thing is, if you look at his run metrics, really good. But that next step for him is he affects the passer. And and sometimes, like, some people say, well, think like Aaron Donald. Okay, there's Don't. no more Aaron Donalds. There's only one. So nobody's him. So think about other people and what they would do. But if those two could affect the passer up the middle, if they could, you know, big, Coach Matt calls it the cylinder. The cylinder. If they could crush the cylinder, then that creates havoc for everything else around them. Plus, they'll take up more bodies. So, I like a big guy like Autry, who's got some sack numbers in his past, sort of like Jarrell did in his heyday. In his, Jarrell J- in his heyday, Jarrell got to the quarterback. Yeah. So, hopefully, Autry can do that. That's shortest path to the quarterback. Well, and ultimately, it's, it's as much about what, pocket penetration he's able to create but also what he frees up for jeffrey simmons who will join us at 11 30 so make sure you're sticking around for that i don't know if big jeff is going to be able to stick uh, sit in the same size chair as mickey ryan but we'll see if <laughs> maybe like half a butt cheek for big jeff when he comes over here to join us at 11 30 i'm looking forward to catching up with him he's a good time um but it's as much about him them allowing them allowing Jeff to get these one-on-one matchups again, to be able to scheme things around Jeffrey Simmons so we can finally see this kind of potential that everybody's been trafficking in for the past two years. And the potential is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the production has been solid to good. Mm -hmm. But we are looking for him, whether you're Titans fan, whether you're Titans media analyst, whatever the case may be, fan of football in general and confused as to who this number 98 is on all of these top 10 lists because you don't watch many Titans games and you see him up there with Aaron Donald and Fletcher Cox and things of this nature, but you're not quite familiar with his game yet. How they scheme around him this year to be able to maximize his abilities is the biggest storyline as, as anything I'm watching in 2021. Absolutely. And I think for him, last year was just such an eye-opening experience because you realized, okay, two people are going to hit me on every play. So I have to affect the game at the same level or even a greater level knowing that two people are going to hit me on every play. They don't have to worry about anybody else but me. But Autry means they have to worry about Autry. Yeah. Or if Tier Tart becomes a guy they can really count on. Maybe he draws some more attention. But Big Jeff with less attention should be an amazing thing for Titans fans. Right. And and it's it will be interesting to see 
you know, we talked to, to Ryan Crow. I don't know if you were over there for the assistant coaches on Saturday morning. Ryan Crow is the new outside linebackers coach. He's been, he's been here since Landry's rookie year, 2018, in various roles. But now the gig is his with Bowen finally achieving this. <laughs> the place, no. <laughs> No, yes. please. Let's not talk about Shane Bowen's what do you role, mean? please. What do you mean? Every Friday I get peppered with Shane Bowen questions. So now the tables have turned, my friend. Welcome to the show. Are you kidding me? Yeah, the, the, Bowen, the Bowen thing continues. Can, can I ask you one thing? And I'm not trying to interrupt you because it's your show. No, you're but back. every time his role comes up between here and Vrabel, do you not get confused again? Because I do. Every time it comes up, I'm like, wait a second. I thought for sure I had this figured out. Now I don't know. Yes, and I will say to you that it's not necessarily our fault. I'll, because I'll feel the, better about myself. Well, Thank you me. should because the way that I look at this, okay, they they, you know, the degrees of transparency that they choose to operate with, <laughs> clear as mud as yeah. we used to say in the country. So, when Vrabel is tired of answering the defensive coordinator questions, one would think that it becomes the answer, much like you know when he's saying that. What I just said about Rashad Weaver, you could plug in for Dez Fitzpatrick about consistency or Dylan Raiden or any of the other any of the other rookies you're talking about because these are just, you know, it's how do I how do I get through this without giving them too much at this point. And some some things he's transparent about, but you understand the dynamic. So when Mike gets to the point last year where he's tired of answering defensive coordinator questions, he said, Well, Shane calls the defense, Shane runs the meetings, Shane, you know, Shane works with X, Y, and Z, and then it becomes, well, no, not really, because he's just getting <laughs> Because he's, he's up here on the podium telling us, yeah, I'm, ga- I'm getting to have relationships with other players on the defense this right. year. What do you mean? What are you talking about? So this is clear as mud. Yeah. I mean, I, he's like, I, I went and visited the safety room the other day. It was magical in there. They've got a, the air freshener. I, we're like, They've got a great guy named Kevin Byard. You heard about him? Yeah. Well, maybe them knowing each other could help everybody. Oof. Here. Yeah. No question about it. So with, uh, with Blaine and Mickey, one to three, every day right after this show, every I joined them. <laughs> I joined them on Fridays. Uh, what what are you guys, what is going to be the theme of today's Blaine and Mickey coming off of Titans practice? On Monday, we do Ding Dong of the Week. That's my favorite segment of any of the segments any of the shows do. So, well, <laughs> Blaine's thing is he's trying to be nice, so he'll call people a ding dong instead of a dirty word, you know. <laughs> We're dads. Like I me. have a little kid. He had a little, uh, his son's a big guy now, but he was once little. So you learn to say things like, don't be a ding dong. So we'll do Ding Dong of the Week. We love it when people participate with that. So as we like to say, Call in and share your ding dong with us. <laughs> we want people's ding dongs on our show today. It's the tagline for the Blaine and Mickey show. One to three, one oh four five the zone. Check out the podcast. They get a bunch of great interviews every day. Well worth your time. Subscribe, rate, and review. Mickey Ryan, always a pleasure, buddy. Yes, sir. And Luke Worsham today, your A to Z counter. Ah, little Luke. Mighty Mouse. Teeny tiny Luke. <laughs> <laughs> that, that felt entirely more dismissive than I was willing to go. <laughs> yeah. When we, will, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Music City Grand Prix before Titans practice wraps up here at St. Thomas Sports Park Day 10 and also what John McClain is tweeting about the Sean Watson because it's a comedy of errors. Heaven help us. We'll get to that coming up next. Don't forget, Jeffrey Simmons is going to join us at 1130. Stick around. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. The NFL preseason is finally here, and the Titans pay an early visit to Julio Jones' former team, the Atlanta Falcons. Mike Keith and Coach Mack have the kickoff Friday night at 6. Finger roll! Oh! Touchdown, Titans! On your home for Titans football and flagship for Titans radio, 104.5 The Zone.
the head coach is near. <laughs> 615-737-1045 is the number. 615-737-1045 is, you, is how you get involved. Now, I cannot tell you what they're doing in front of me right now until practice ends. Just know that Kirby Allen Kirby is is my meat shield out here at practice in case any uh, you know stray stray players or stray objects come my way. You want to get involved, 615-737-1045. So let's talk about this Music City Grand Prix. Lucas was down there, uh, I think. Were you, you were there two of the three days, right? You called a, a soccer game in Chattanooga over the weekend? Yeah, I was in Chattanooga on Saturday, so I made it down to the track Friday and Sunday. I was there for quite a while on Sunday. Got to catch the whole race. Okay, so what's quite a while? Because I saw V-Love, one of our uh, loyal, loyal legion here on the show. I saw, well, actually, I saw I saw Tomahawk Chop. I saw uh, I Ben. Um, I can't remember Ben's last name. I saw a bunch of the listeners to the show and people who watch the A to Z Sports Primetime Show. So, so that made me very happy to see a bunch of our people out there walk, walking around the uh, the grounds and the campus at Nissan Stadium around the track. But what was a while? Because I know that thing opened up at like 10 a.m. and people were down there from like 10 to 9. Yeah, I wasn't like V-Love who was probably there at like the crack of dawn on all three days. No, Just I was there hammered. <laughs> around like noon on Sunday because uh, I wanted to check out the GT race because we discovered one of our buddies – Father and brother has raced GT their entire lives, so they ah. took us into the paddock, got to look at the car, check out the race because his brother was driving. We had no idea about this friend, uh, that he's in a racing family, so we kind of got to be a part of that. That was pretty cool. So now you're infinitely closer to the said friend than you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, maybe maybe you had, maybe he had some undesirable traits early on in the friendship. Now you're willing to overlook them. <laughs> well, they called the GT race early because there were a couple wrecks and they had to get everything cleaned up in time for the Indy race. And that was as stop and go as any race I've watched in a while. I uh, yeah, I mean the race the race itself was fantastic. Um, and I mean the course, the course was so interesting to see the way that they had it up and back on Korean Vets uh, on the Korean Vets Bridge. And then around the, basically the parking lot at Nissan Stadium, so they were able to take av- take advantage of the straightaways to get speed on the straight line of the bridge. But then once you got once you got into the uh, the more treacherous part of the track, and and it sounded like the track was just generally uh, generally treacherous was the way that that all of the uh, everybody everybody that experienced Nashville traffic during like basically two thirty to six thirty p.m. on a weekday, that's what that was what was racing around downtown Nashville. Over the past three days, but the uh, the inaugural Music City Grand Prix, not Grand Prix, Grand Prix, uh, it got, was cracking up every time they would say that out loud over like the speaker phones because I'm like, you're in Tennessee, buddy, and nobody calling it the Grand Prix <laughs> down here. All right, well, it's just t- Tennessee geography, ch- uh, Tennessee geography beat Lebanon, you know, Salina, Lafayette, Lafayette. Yeah, around here it's a Grand Prix. Things. You've got zero chance of people calling it a Grand Prix around here now what, what's rep brian say you got to adapt to the culture know right. your audience <laughs> lafayette i still can't get over that 615-737-1045 so you know i i was curious i was curious as to what the attendance would be like first and foremost how it would affect just general going selfishly i was curious to see how it would affect general goings on downtown like if it would disrupt things downtown the way that some of these big events do because this is a three-year contract that IndyCar has with Nashville and uh, to have the Music City Grand Prix. And we'll see how they adjust the course itself, the track itself, in years to come. Because I think this was, uh, for an experiment, it was well executed uh, in the first year of doing it. But I'm sure there will be some adjustments in future years with this particular race. But I was curious, if we put it out on a poll, open-ended, Lucas, if we can pull up some of those responses on Twitter, at Buck Rising is where you can vote on the polls that we put out each and every day. I was curious as to what was people's favorite part of the race itself. Was it just having the race in town? Are you are you a diehard Indy fa- IndyCar fan? I didn't I didn't know, given that there was 110,000 people over the three days. It was a pretty good crowd. Pretty good crowd from both, you know, locals and out of town. What what what, what was what has been some of the responses? And if you want to weigh in with your favorite part of the race this weekend, did you go? 615 615- 737-1045. What was your experience? I'd love to hear from the callers as well. What do we got on Twitter? Well, so we put out a couple open-ended polls today. Uh, we asked who's the most famous Titans fan. We got about 45 responses on that. We asked who's the Titans' best defensive player. Still a bunch coming in on that. Fuck, nobody has responded to what was your favorite part of the Music <laughs> City Grand Prix. I think this is the first time ever in the history of our polls that we have legit what? had crickets. 
What? Are you not kidding one, me? Not one. Not one. I'm doing like a double take, and there's no engagement. Of all the stupid stuff we produce from my Twitter account. Oh, my God. This not one. Is Nobody has not anything to one say. one response? Nope. Wow. You know, so, okay, so I did this I did this on the primetime show, right? Like the primetime show, uh, A to Z Sports, Sunday to Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central Time is where you can catch the live streaming show that I do on Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. So primetime, the night before the radio show is always like how I work out my material. I'm like a stand-up comedian going through his routine the night before or the day before, basically. So that's where I'll workshop my topics um, to see where people engage. And... You know the the grand the Grand Prix the Grand Prix topic itself, I, varying levels of disinterest. To people were excited about the idea that Nashville's just getting another big event, and IndyCar is a big event. Um, but you know, varying. I was just kind of like, yeah, you know, a lot of these people on the internet they don't necessarily live in Nashville, whereas on the Zone we're talking to an inherently more local audience than I do on the internet. Every night. So I'm like, yeah, maybe maybe it's just people, Titans fans from out of town who are here to talk about the Hall of Fame and they don't really care about the Grand Prix, Grand Prix conversation. Uh, but the idea, <laughs> I can't get over that. Not a single response. Do people just not give a damn about I, this? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty speechless. Like, we could put out what's your favorite Mike Vrabel game day outfit, and we'd get, like, 150 responses. So I... I, I mean, we've never had... It's never been an issue. Getting responses to a poll. We finally found the one thing. IndyCar is where we've pushed my pushed we our audience them. too far. We We're stumped them. <laughs> we stumped them. How about that? 615-737-1045. Sonny is in Nashville. He wants to talk about the Grand Prix. What's up, Sonny? How's it going? It's going great. I really enjoy getting to spend time in the pits. That, that, that's, that, yeah, that was, that was your favorite part? Uh, for me, and then we sat in the grandstands right across from the pit and just to watch those guys work and to have such a spectacular race in Nashville. You know, I've driven those roads my entire life. It was awesome. Yeah, that's that's what I, you know, and thank you for the call, Sonny, 615-737-1045. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, you know, if you're, a, if you're a local, if you're a native Nashvillian, having just these kind of events – target nashville has to mean something right where you're talking about the bridge that you go over each and every day as a part of your commute on your way to work if you work in downtown or somebody who's grown up around the city your entire life and then to see different kinds of things be it the nfl draft the stanley cup playoffs indycar coming to town on a three-year deal like all this stuff has to mean something to people i would imagine or at least people who care about the growth of the city. I'm sure many, many Nashvillians are like, yeah, no, we, we don't need more people. People are the problem. This is why, this is why the, the rush hour is a four-hour time span across every afternoon. What are you, what are you smiling about back there? Are you we, cheesing we, about We something? got a response. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody finally responded. Michael Burgett yeah, replied to the poll. He said, I think it was the racing over the bridge. That was an amazing shot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you know, you know what wasn't amazing? Because Kirby, Kirby Allen Kirby, who was out here uh, protecting me, from uh, from anything that might come come to- in my direction while we do the radio show live at Titans training camp, Kirby and I were talking about the race because Kirby's a big race fan, and he was he was saying how he would have done it differently, of course, and the way that he would prefer they outline the course itself next year so it's more involved with the landscape of downtown because the the aerial shots, Lucas, they were I I, I watched I watched so I was in I was in Nissan Stadium. In the south end zone, like seven stories up, which was where the tent I was in was at. And it was a great setup. And you could see the cars better than you could down on the ground because the cars, I mean, you're, you've just got an aerial, an aerial view and you're seeing more of the course itself. Now, the cars are very, very low to the ground, so you're still, you're still working against some optic stuff. But a lot of it I was able to watch on the TVs that were in the tent that I was at. And every time they tried to do an aerial shot of this damn thing, they kept having to find ways around PSC medals. Just this blight in the middle of downtown, this awful, awful, godforsaken eyesore sitting there on the Cumberland River. Because it makes it makes our city literally look like a dump from the sky. If you don't show downtown, if the course isn't going around the west bank of the Cumberland, then it looks like we live in a pile of trash it looks and scrap like, metal. It looks like a Michael Bay, like it's a set of a Michael Bay Transformers movie. It, it looks like where the Transformers go to die. Like this is... <laughs> I 
couldn't get over it. I could not get over it because, I, 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 you know, it was a comedy of errors. And f- someday, uh, there's no way that they get rid of PSC Metals, the city does, because that thing has to be worth, I mean, the, the, la- the, the real estate itself is worth God knows how much alone, much less the, uh, the scrapyard business is not going anywhere anytime soon. So I can't, I can't imagine that the people who own PSC would be inclined to sell. But my God, was that ugly from the sky. I really, really hated that for having Nashville shown off on a uh, on an international stage. But people got their money's worth. Uh, you know, I did, I did, oh, yeah. there wouldn't be, there was never going to be a lot of overtaking, I guess, with the way the track was laid out. I think a lot of cars just wanted to get out of there with as little damage as possible. But there were a ton of wrecks, a ton of lead changes, and a guy who goes airborne after lap five and damages his front wing and Marcus Erickson ends up winning the thing. So the entertainment value was there from start to finish. Yeah, I, I mean, and throughout the course of, like, all of the events, right, the, the trucks... The trucks are crazy. It's like real-life Mario Kart, watching these dudes go off ramps and stuff like that, seeing them just sky through the air in these little mini trucks, whipping around, whipping around uh, uh, Korean vets. A couple of uh, them almost started swinging on each other on the track on Friday. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was on the phone with you, and then we saw it on the screen. <laughs> Two no, okay. drivers got out of their trucks. Everybody's, the crowd's going nuts. They're, like, shoving each other and clearly yelling at each other as the yellow flag's oh, up. Oh, my God. One of them spikes the other one's helmet. It was very, like, WWE style. It could have even been staged. I'm so glad you reminded me of this because I called Lucas Saturday. I'm like, hey, are you down there? I may, I may make my way down. I didn't end up going until Sunday itself. But I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah. And he's, and he's saying, yeah, we're down here. You know, we're, we're walking by X, Y, and Z right now. And then he just says, oh, these guys are getting into it. Oh, oh, like he's getting excited on the phone. He's not paying attention to me anymore. And then all, all of a sudden you just hear Lucas shouting far away from the phone, fight, <laughs> fight, hit him. <laughs> What are you doing? I thought they were about to start swinging at each other on the track, and I'm sorry. So, everybody wants to see that. So instead, you just instigate everything and start screaming "fight" at the drivers. I, I, I don't know. It was you know something about something about hearing the hearing the cars coming down. I don't know, man. They get you feeling some type of way. You see two dudes shoving each other on the track. You want them to fight. It's unbelievable. I that's as proud as you as I've ever been. Six one five. 737-1045. Don't forget, Jeffrey Simmons, Titans defensive lineman, going to join us out here live at St. Thomas Sports Park here in about 15 minutes once practice concludes. But coming up next, I'd like to talk about something that took place in Saturday's practice regarding Harold Landry and a really, really interesting soundbite from his new position coach, Ryan Crow, who is overseeing the outside linebackers for the first time full-time this year, now that Shane Bowen has been promoted. It's really interesting in the way that they are approaching Harold Landry's development in a contract year. Because nobody, nobody would sit here and argue that Harold Landry hasn't been their best option off the edge. Maybe not since 2018, but he had a he had a great rookie season. He went on and, and had a great 2019. Things kind of leveled off a little bit for him, though, last year. And so Ryan Crow had some really, really good observations when we spoke to him on Saturday that I'd like to come back to. Your calls as well coming up next. I'm Buck Rising, and this is 104.5 The Zone. The Titans and Falcons go at it in the first preseason game of the year. Continue his coverage all day Friday. Into the end zone. Touchdown, Titans! With kickoff at 6 p.m. On your home for Titans football. 104.5 The Zone.
because I'm strolling the practice field trying to avoid, you know, the ire of anybody that might yell at me for talking into a microphone like somebody I'm getting a harsh look from right now. <laughs> 615-737-1045 is the number. 615-737-1045. So, um, what I want to talk about here is what happened at practice on Saturday. Saturday, we had the assistant coaches on the defensive side of the ball, and we were asking questions about Harold Landry, a perpetual topic of conversation with Harold Landry. It seems every offseason is how does Harold Landry go about developing this elusive second move? How does he become more than just a speed guy off the edge? Because two years of production, solid production, by the way, have been the case for Harold Landry. And it's something that, Lucas, can you tell that I'm panting? <laughs> Just realized that I'm breathing hard into the microphone. So I'm walking across the practice facility. That's so sad. So sad. Do you hear that? Yeah. How many, you, you wearing like a Fitbit or something? Are you getting your steps in? I mean, I'm trying to get my steps in. It's all I can do. Otherwise, I'm just going to sit out here at the tent and look at Kirby for three hours, which delights me, by the way, because Kirby's Kirby is doing this job the way that it needs to be done. We'll get into the Harold Landry conversation here in just a second, but we were talking about the Music City Grand, Grand Prix, and Matt from Nashville has called in, wants to have, uh, wants to weigh in on the subject. What's up, Matt? Man, love you guys' show. Uh, yes, yeah, the Grand Prix. So we went out there Friday. We're a family of five, so going to one of these events is anything but cheap and inexpensive. But you know that's fine. At least we're able to to be home that day, and the, and the kids had fun. Uh, in regard to that fight, that was actually from uh, like a race or two before, so that wasn't in Nashville. I wish it would have been because that would have been awesome. Um, you know, my kids loved watching the fight on the screen. And, of course, mom and mom and dad are like, oh, yeah, don't don't ever do that. And, and that, that's not wise to throw punches and throw someone's helmet on the ground. So I just want to give you guys a small clarification on that one. Um, in regards to the race itself, I mean, the kids the kids loved it. We, we had fun. Thank God it wasn't super sunny. It was kind of cloudy right. and overcast. So that made it enjoyable Friday. The only thing that was interesting was did you guys notice how – some of the grandstands weren't finished and yes. that caused issues with people trying to find their seat because other people have had reserve seats. Now their reserve seats were being taken by other people who had nowhere to sit. And also, I don't know about Saturday and Sunday, but on Friday, the, the free water stations weren't available either. And I, I, I didn't know if you guys knew about all that or not. Uh, I do not know about the water stations because I was stealing bottles of water from the tent that I was at and then traversing the campus. Lucas, did you notice free water stations out there for people? Um, I, yeah, I noticed one, but we He's had... He's lying. He was sloshed. He's just trying no, to cover up how no, drunk he was. We had, we had friends that, had, that paid a bunch of money for, like, VIP, so they just unlimited free water, so they would go in and get us water bottles. Look at us. When did we become such snobs about sporting <laughs> events? <laughs> what happened? You, you, you're no longer the voice of the people. You're no longer the man of the people. You're one of us, one of these media elites. Gross. Kirby's just shaking his head vigorously. Six one five seven three seven. I was just gaming the system, man. I'm just using a wristband that I didn't pay for. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing wrong. Gaming the system is my entire career. It's the only reason that I sit in, sit in front of this microphone with you guys for three hours a day. But I, I think you know the things like the the grandstands not being finished. They're logistical. Logistically, it wasn't perfect. Nobody's saying that it was perfect. I just say I'm just looking at it from the first time our city has hosted such an event. I thought that it went off almost seamlessly with north of 100,000 people attending over the three days. And also the weather. The weather really, I mean, made the made all the difference in the world. I saw my buddy Joey Molinero, who does, who's the, he's the impressions guy from Barstool. He's the one who does the fake Nick Saban. He's all over Sports Center from time to time, and uh, I think he does a really good Chris Collinsworth, too. Anyway, Joey was here because he's from Indianapolis. He's a big IndyCar fan. He was hosting parties. Um, at bars across the weekend, and he he texted me. He goes, Nashville is the back sweat capital of the world <laughs> because of what it was like out there the past three days. Just soft, soft coming down here to the southeast and thinking that they can hang with us in uh, in these temp temperate climates. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. We we can uh, we can touch more on the Music City Grand Prix later if you would like. But in the meantime, I want to get back to this Harold Landry conversation before Jeffrey Simmons joins us little little over five minutes from now uh with harold landry we we have been having this conversation about him developing a second move coming out of college 
into his rookie season, coming into his sophomore season, last year his third season, and things kind of being kind of stalling for him in a way that was pretty pretty apparent to anybody who was watching him play last year. Now, I wrote about this for A to Z Sports Nashville.com, and I cited some of his statistics because he went in 2019 when he had, he so far, it's a, it's a young career, but 2019 has been the best year of his career to this point. 2019, he was top 25 in quarterback hurries. Last year, he was in the top 10. But I did note that eight of those pre- eight of those hurries came in week 17 against the Houston Texans, who had won four games that year and were not starting Laramie Tunsil. So it seems like the league, offensive linemen, tackles around football, have figured out Harold Landry's moves a little bit, or at least the one move that he has. So we asked Ryan Crow, who's their new outside linebackers coach, about this on Saturday. This is what he had to say. Yeah, so all I told Harold was I, I took his fastball away. You know, he's a speed dip guy. I think everyone that watches his film uh, throughout the league realizes he's a speed dip guy. So the conversation with him was you can't use that in camp. you got to find something else, make some new mistakes, learn some other moves, try them, see if they work, and then kind of create that second and third pitch. Is that not the best thing you've heard from a coach in so long, that they want him to make new mistakes out here on the practice field. They've banned the one thing that Harold Landry, or the thing, not the one thing that Harold Landry does well, because I do think he's a good, he's a solid player. He's been one of their best defensive players up front, which, you know, the best among bad options over the past couple of years. But still, to his credit, he's a good player. But how does he find ways to affect the game differently? Crow called him there a speed dip guy. So what he's saying is, yeah, we took away his fastball for training camp. He can't do that right now. We're asking him to make new mistakes, find ways to test out other stuff, get out of your comfort zone. Now, we don't know that Shane Bowen and Mike Vrabel weren't asking him to do that in years prior, but this is the this is the best analysis or the best approach that we've heard a coach tell us about with how they're trying to get Harold to change his game a little bit. How do you become more than just this speed dip guy, more than just this dude who comes screaming off the edge and tries to out, you know, just out quick you at the line of scrimmage? Because that's not always going to work. It was a it was a good it was a good lesson for him coming into the league his rookie year because he was working with Taylor Lewan a great deal, and Taylor was showing him you know if Harold did this this is how Taylor would combat it as an opposing offensive tackle with various hand fighting moves that these guys use on the line of scrimmage in the trenches, if we're to be cliche, but to hear that that is the strategy that they're taking with Harold Landry right now I thought was great was a great was great insight. Um, as to how Ryan Crow is handling that position, and specifically a guy who is going to be, you know, they're, they're going to have to make a business decision on Harold Landry at the end of the season. This is a contract year for Harold as a second-round pick. They will have to find ways to maximize his abilities or find another way to build out this core of outside linebackers around Bud Dupree, who is now the highly paid veteran on this roster. Maybe the math going Bud Dupree's way this offseason inherently works against Harold Landry. We don't know that, but this is the opportunity. This year, this camp, this season is his opportunity to prove to him that he's more than just a speed dip guy, as Ryan Crow was saying there. We'll come back and we'll talk with uh, another promising Titans defensive player. Jeffrey Simmons is going to join us live at training camp. Stick around. It's going to be a good time once practice wraps up here at St. Thomas Sports Park. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. Wall-to-wall Titans training camp coverage happens here. Bam! This is your exclusive home for Titans football. 104.5 The Zone.
Ford. We appreciate them making it possible for us to be out here at St. Thomas Sports Park covering practice number 10 for the Tennessee Titans. Jeffrey Simmons, soon as practice concludes, looks like there's a few seconds left on the clock. They're going through some, uh, well, I can't tell you until practice is over. <laughs> Kirby is out here monitoring my restraint for the next few minutes until these things wrap up. But Jeffrey Simmons will join us whenever they do wrap up at the desk here at St. Thomas Sports Park. So we're having this conversation about Harold Landry and, and how he kind of changes things defensively. But ultimately, I mean, the most important storyline, well, I guess the most important storyline of this team this year is defense, is how they find ways, if they found ways, to rectify the defense itself. Is this something that all of their work in the offseason, we've talked we talked a ton about this, Lucas. And, and it was funny, Lucas and I were talking about you know, our pre-show prep and things like that today. And I was like, we have had one offensive player on the radio show from the Titans this, this training camp, Kendall Lamb. Kendall Lamb, who is competing for a right tackle spot. Nobody's, nobody wants to talk about the offense. I mean, they do want to talk about the offense. They want to talk about Julio Jones, who was not out here today. They want to talk about A.J. Brown, also not out here today. But in the absence of those two, and Derrick Henry, of course, is of – great import he'll be at the podium later today nfl network's broadcast is also set up out here i'm pretty sure he's going to be on television prior to the podium i'm going to spend a little time with them before he meets with the local media um people people all people want to do unless i'm reading this wrong is talk about the defense and and certainly the titans are happy to service up defensive players because god knows that unit needs good pr this year i mean it is it is funny the way that things have shifted so drastically in that direction. So Jeffrey, how Jeffrey kind of factors into this situation, I think is, is pretty interesting. Because one thing that I want to ask him, I want to ask Jeffrey Simmons what he thinks of Jim Schwartz. Jim Schwartz, who is a senior defensive assistant with this team after spending a decade here in Tennessee as a defensive coordinator, position coach, and, and helping this team try and make a push for the Super Bowl and being a part of very successful staffs during his time here, right? He's one of the biggest topics of the offseason is how, right, people sarcastically on Twitter, how long is Shane Bowen's leash before they yank it and bring Jim Schwartz in to fix all that ails them defensively? How much was this something that was kind of put on Mike Vrabel, if not his own idea, to kind of fix what ails them defensively? Jim Schwartz, who during his, the history of his career on defense has had standout defensive linemen and particularly def interior defensive linemen to scheme around. I talk about guys like Albert Hainsworth during his stint here in Tennessee in the way that at the, you know, for what, three, two or three or four years, Albert Hainsworth was at the peak of his powers, one of the top players at his position not just because of physical ability, but because Jim Schwartz found favorable positions to scheme around what was one of their most talented, if not the most talented player that they had on that side of the ball. Fletcher Cox, another Mississippi State product like Jeffrey Simmons, who Schwartz had as the defensive coordinator in Philadelphia. How successful they have been on defense scheming around Fletcher Cox as an interior defensive lineman who is built similarly similarly to Jeff. That's a tough word for me, Curb. Built close to what Jeffrey Simmons looks like, except Jeffrey Simmons is more a, more a svelte superhero-type-looking human being as opposed to Fletcher Cox, who is uh, larger and uh, more, more difficult to move around, but does still possess otherworldly traits at that position. So I want to talk to Jeffrey about what his interactions with Jim Schwartz have been like and how that dynamic has kind of changed for him because we know what they were doing last year to find him in those one-on-one -on -one matchups. That was the best, if only, thing that Jadavion Clowney did, the only purpose that Jadavion Clowney served for this football team. So we'll get into that with Jeffrey Simmons. We'll also carry, De carry Derrick Henry's press conference from the podium for you. A lot of great top uh, Titans content coming to you on the other side. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. Jay Martin Ramon. Just say it how you want to. Talk about a lot of things that are happening down on Rocky Top. Yeah, I said down. I know it's over on Rocky Top. Screw it. Say it how you want to. I, I don't care. <laughs> we do not care. 
Jay Martin and Ramon. Jason Martin and Ramon Foster. Tomorrow morning starting at 6 on 104.5 The Zone. This is Damon Amendolara with the CBS Sports Minute. This was a jumbo-sized Hall of Fame class. The Pro Football Hall of Fame this week inducted two classes, the 2020 and 2021, because last year's was postponed due to COVID, and the 15 additional inductees from the NFL 100 celebration. All iconic names and legendary careers, but let's count down the top five. Offensive lineman Alan Fanica, smash mouth offensive lineman for the Steelers. Number four, Charles Woodson, nine Pro Bowls and the championship of the 2010 Packers. Number three, Megatron Calvin Johnson at his apex, one of the best wide receivers ever. Number two, Troy Palomalo turned the safety position into a scoring option. And the number one overall player this weekend, obviously, the incomparable Peyton Manning. What a double class it was. This is Damon Amendolara. At Napa, we keep things moving. If it has wheels and an engine, we help keep it on the road. And if it's on the road, we have parts for it. And if you need a part, you can get it fast, like same-day pickup or next-day delivery fast. At Napa, when we're not thinking about cars, we're thinking about the people who drive them. Because when it comes to serving you in our community, our motor never quits. That's Napa know-how. Same-day pickup and next-day delivery available at participating stores and on in-stock items only. Attorney Joe Cordell. For many men, divorce brings a bewildering sense of loss. You feel adrift, isolated, like you're the only person in the world. But the good news is, you're not alone. Cordell and Cordell is here to help. For more than 30 years, Cordell and Cordell has been there to guide men through all aspects of divorce. And we'll be there for you. Schedule an appointment with one of Cordell and Cordell's Nashville area attorneys. 810 Crescent Center Drive, Suite 160, Franklin, Tennessee, 37067. Day number 10 at St. Thomas Sports Park has concluded. Practices in the books, gathered at midfield. They will break. They will disperse. We will talk to Jeffrey Simmons momentarily. Live out here at Titans Training Camp. Derrick Henry will be at the podium as well. Would be a, uh, will be a, I'm sure, an enthralling press conference from Derrick Henry. But it will be curious to get his perspective, as always. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation with Big Jeff. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in on the conversation. So some observations from practice today. Kendall Lamb did leave with a what appeared to be a left arm injury during the first period of practice. So when we talked about the uh, – <laughs> this is something that's funny, by the way, and something that I, I have neglected to bring up until now. So that we, we talked at the start of the show – about the unofficial depth chart that the team put out. Hell, they we got a press release about the unofficial depth chart that the team put out. And I was laughing because there's no way in hell that Mike Vrabel is going to a- answer unofficial depth chart questions. Like, it's just not humanly possible. We get, we, we The most we can do is do a stand-up routine with Mike and ask him about a 5- to 12-week timeline for Carson Wentz. But as far as unofficial depth chart stuff, he's going to tell us that he doesn't know this thing exists. But I'm looking at this thing and laughing because in what world do they do this? Since when? Since when the, do they want us asking questions as a media corps about the unofficial depth chart? Who who is is this for the is this for the fans? I don't think it's for us. I sure as hell don't think it's for us because Jeff Swaim is not the starting tight end. I'm sorry, nothing personal, respectfully to Jeff, but he just hasn't been out here for practice. I don't know how seriously to take Ty Sambrello as the right tackle, the starting right tackle, heading into the first preseason game. But that's what it says on the sheet in front of me. Who, who is this being provided for other than to drive fan engagement, social media engagement right now for the fans? It's something that I don't necessarily understand. 615-737-1045. Be curious to see how Mike Vrabel handles the uh, unofficial depth chart questions. Maybe they put it out. I don't know if Mike's talking today, Lucas. Do we know if Mike's talking today? I am only seeing Derrick Henry uh, coming up at the podium. That's the only thing on the Titans' websites right now. Okay. We will see. If the head coach is available to answer said depth chart questions later on, 615 737 1045. No, Vrabel now, will be up there. Vrabel, Vrabel will be, up, will there, be yeah. up there. So we can <laughs> so we can look. I'm sure that will be a press conference. They're all worth listening to, as far as I'm concerned. Because if you want to learn about your football team right now, there's no better way to do it than to hear from the head coach 
on a daily basis than when we're out here at Titans training camp. But the uh, the onslaught of depth chart questions that it will produce will be funny. So we are seeing the players disperse right now. Uh, elsewhere, I think the conversation without A.J. Brown and Julio Jones on the field, this will be, you know, nearly a week since Julio has been out here. Mike Vrabel told us tongue-in-cheek that the Julio Jones, that the Julio watch will continue, you know, being a little banged up in a practice one day, uh, being a little banged up in a practice one day and then being basically bubble-wrapped for the remainder of practice. It becomes an interesting conversation without these two guys, the top two guys out on the field, who takes advantage of their reps, who takes advantage of the opportunities that will be available to them. Um, I would say, and Jeffrey Simmons is walking over to the uh, to the setup right now here at St. Thomas Sports Park, so we'll hear from Big Jeff momentarily. We appreciate him taking some time. So we'll get back to the conversation about the wide receivers momentarily. We appreciate Jeff being willing to sit down. What's going on, boss? Not much. We're just uh, just making it happen out here at training camp. We'll get him mic'd up and put him on the headset here in just a second. All right, Jeff. We well, you know. Day number 10 in the books. It's going great, man. Um, I think the intensity on the defensive side, especially, um, you know, it's where we want to be. We got to keep raising the expectations, um, and we got to meet the standards um, on defense side. You know, the leader's talking, and um, everyone else following. So, I mean, what more can we ask for? Yeah, but you're one of these leaders now. I mean, this is this is going into year three for you. You've had such a big impact on this unit, your your side of the ball, and this team as a whole since coming here. You're the guy breaking down the huddles now pregame, or at least that was the case last year. I imagine stuff like that will continue. How much different is your life with this team now heading into year three? You know, it's kind of like when you go back to being a baby. You know, you take them steps, you're learning, um, you're seeing your older siblings doing something that you're going to have to eventually pick up on. And it's the same thing in football. You know, each year I think you grow as a football player, as a leader, and I think – each and every year, um, especially, you know, since, I guess, high school, you know, um, go to college and here, you know, coming in, you're learning as a rookie. You know, no matter you're a first-round drafted guy, you know, you see all these leaders, they leading, and you're trying to pick up some of the tips that they actually, um, you know, that they talking about or, you know, they showing you how to be a leader. And I think that right there helped me out a lot, you know, watching guys like Jarrell Casey and now um, Kevin Byer, you know, he probably one of the great, uh, one of the best leaders I've been around, you know, his communications. His, um, you know, a lot of guys just kind of talk sometimes, but you got guys like KB who actually do it. And um, I think that just helping me out to be a better leader. And just uh, um, every day I come here, um, if it's in the meeting room or on the field, try to be the best I could be. Titans defensive lineman Jeffrey Simmons is here with us on 104.5 The Zone, fresh off the practice field. Uh, the defense has been carrying the day through 10 practices you're not in your head for the radio audience you know you know what's going on i mean we're all we're all out here watching it too that's how you guys progress from the down year that you had and down year is a funny way to put it because you won your division for the first time in the better part of a decade but defensively obviously there are strides to make um what have are we making too much of training camp right now jeff with the way that we've seen at least out here watching you guys take you uh see you take a leap forward I, um i think it's one of the things where you know as i said um in the past in the media when i did the media last um week or whatever it may be i think we know about last year we had that, yeah. that feeling about that the way we was in, on defense last year well but you got like, vultures like me yammering about it for 12 months so you it's, yeah, it's, so, it's enough at some point yeah, i guess sure you, you did <laughs> and you know of course you know we get reminded when yeah. we get when we got back here but i think us taking the next step, we're not thinking about that. We're thinking about how can we be better each and every day when we come to practice doing this camp. And I think they're just helping us out on defense. You know, guys flying around with uh, tremendous um, energy. You got energy, you got communication, you got everybody just being on the same page. If we're not on the same page, you know, we're going fast, everyone playing field school, whatever it may be. You know, so I think that just helping us out on defense, cause everyone on one accord. You know, once you get on one accord, and whatever it may be, um, the call, you know, everyone on one accord. I think, one more, like I said, what more can you ask for as a defense? Because everyone's flying to the ball, everyone doing their job. So, The dynamic with Danico out here playing alongside you and, and Tier, really, the three of you, and I, I've seen some of the depth guys working, but the three, the three of you up front seem to be the leaders at your position at this point. 
playing next to these two guys, what can that do for a player like yourself up front? Um, I think it, it's always great when you have a, a great D-line. Um, the great D-line, you know, it just don't be about yourself. It's for the team. Um, you know, we making um, a lot of um, negative plays in the backfield, no matter if it's tackle for loss, sacks, you know, disrupting the time of the quarterback and throw, batting ball down. I think that just helped the team out. And um, just coming out of our room, I think we've got a great group, you know, especially with the vet, um, Nico. Um, he he brings a lot to the room, you know, his disruption. You know, he he's a great guy, um, you know, off the field because, you know, you don't have I, – I don't think you probably don't get too many vets that really just – Take his time to, to um, like communicate with the um, with the rookies or you know younger guys. And I'm still just going to my third year, so I'm still asking you know the Nico um, question. You know, going to his eight or nine year, you know, it just always you know like I said, I'm still trying to learn. You know, because I'm like I said, I'm still a young guy. You know, I'm still want to um, take my game to the next level. And having Nico, Tart, you know, a lot of guys in that room, merch, whoever it may be, who on the field, I think we're gonna have a great room. We're gonna come and play ball every day. So I mean, every Sunday. It's crazy every time you say that, and I don't, I don't just say that to flatter you because you're sitting here in front of me, but you don't seem like, I mean, going into your three doesn't seem like that at all for you. I mean, the fans don't respond to you in that way. They they treat you, as, and, and you are a, ma- a staple for this team, and I, I know it's uncomfortable to talk about yourself sometimes in that light, but I just, I, I, I guess I want to commend you on the way that you've kind of grown into this role because it really, really shows up in the way that you carry yourself on the field and the way that the rest of your teammates respond to you. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate it. Um, I think it's one of the things where, you know, coming in as a rookie, you know, I, um, I came in hurt. Um, you know, I'm just trying to learn. I think um, once you gain that trust and, and that uh, respect from your teammates, I think that just helps you out as a per- player, but as a person as well. I think it's ma- just make you want to be more humble. Um, I think um, you know, that's where I came from, my, my background with mom, you know, just um, keeping God first. You know, I, I you know, thank God for everything, but, you know, I just, that mindset of, you know, um, no matter what it is, you know, I want to, I want the best for myself, you know. My standards are real high. You know, I'm a very competitive guy. Um, I hate to lose, and whatever it may be, you know, I'm a um, you know, young guy, old guy. I'm going I'm to keep that edge, I should say. I'm going to keep that edge to try to um, keep the edge on my other uh, opponents, so. I'm thanking God for that breeze right now out here at St. Thomas Sports Park. Titans training camp. Jeffrey Simmons, defensive lineman, kind enough to sit down with us. Uh, a couple more for you, Jeff, and then I'll let you get out of here because I know you had a hard day of work, and I know it's not done yet. But with with the the staff that they've put around you, Coach Williams is one of my favorite assistant coaches to talk to. I always appreciate his insights and the way that he kind of helps us as media understand what they're coaching you up to do. Um, between him and now having Jim Schwartz in the room, who's worked with a guy like Fletcher Cox, who you're obviously familiar with, before that coming to Tennessee, being able to maximize a player like Albert Hainsworth in the middle of their defenses at the time when they were at the peak of their powers, what of those two guys helped you do so far? I know it's still pretty early with Schwartz. I guess how much inter- interaction do you get with Coach Schwartz? Um, I, I didn't talk to him a lot. Um, you know, since he's been there, he was um, my first time meeting him. He told me about the guys who he have coached, um, especially Fletcher Cox because of Mississippi State, I guess. Um, but um, just having a coach like that on the staff that, you know, known for having defense alignments at the top tier, you know, I think it's just great for not just me, but everyone across on the defense. Um, and then Coach William, man, uh, Coach T, you know, we always joking around every each and every day. But, you know, I have learned so much from Coach T because he's one of them guys that, you know, he wanted the best from his players. And, um I can't say much more about him because, um, I mean, it shows, you know, even on the field, um, no matter what it is, you know, he's going to push it to the highest limit. Um, like I said, he wants so much out of um, not just me, but you, you see him coaching Tart. You see him coaching Naquan Jones. And them, you know, the same way coaching each and every one of uh, us, the older guys. Um, um, so I think just having them two guys, especially, you know, on the defensive side and defensive line side, I think it just, you know, I always say, what more can you ask for? It's, it's, that's one of the things, like, what more can you ask for, especially guys who have a defensive lineman who's playing at the top tier or, you know, some of the top defensive linemen have coached some of the top defensive linemen. We were talking to Coach Williams on Saturday. He's out here ragging you about your diet. Did I get back he, to you? He, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I, I forgot to say something about him. Um, he know that, you know, he walked in on me this morning. I got to get on him the way he be eating. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah so uh, we're going to get his diet right, too. 
Jeffrey Simmons, Titans defensive lineman, kind enough to stop by our table here at tra uh, Titans training camp. I, I appreciate your time, boss. Continued health and success, and we're looking forward to seeing what you're going to do this season. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Tighten up. All right. We will come back and wrap this thing up. Mike Rabel, Derek Henry will be at the press conference later on in, sh in the show. Stick around. This is 104.5 The Zone. Lately, we've been getting a lot of calls and questions about acoustic wave therapy for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. This is a relatively new treatment for ED.
and 104.5 The Zone. Final hour is upon us. Been a fun show so far, live from Titans training camp. Always happy to be out here. Weather has been beautiful. The interviews have been fun. Jeffrey Simmons was great last segment. If you missed any of it, make sure, as Lucas said, you check out the podcast wherever it is that you get your podcast. It's very simple. It's just my name. It's the Buck Rising Show. If you're watching on Zone TV, you can see it right in front of me uh, and covering Lucas's head. Does it bother you that the show logo covers your head on the Zone TV chat? Does that does that drive you crazy? I bet it does. Uh, yeah, that's why you'll see me sitting down from time to time. To oh, you chill. Avoid the Buck Rising Show logo you're- on my face. <laughs> but it just, it just looks like the it, when Sometimes when you get too close to it, it looks like the logo is your head and the logo has a body of its own which is now that I've made fun of you karma has struck me because I'm doing a TikTok on Zone TV basically <laughs> yeah. with the way that it froze up so I just justice is it, served you're welcome. justice is served thank you very much <laughs> 615 737 1045 Derek Henry is going to be at the podium at St. Thomas Sports Park Mark Vrabel as well we will make sure to carry those press conferences live for you so we can hear from the defending NFL rushing champion and the head coach after day 10. But Simmons there, the, the conversation was a good one, and I'm glad that we got the opportunity to catch up with him because that 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 note or that question that I asked him about Jim Schwartz and his work with Hainsworth, his work with Fletcher Cox um, over the course of his career and many other defensive linemen, Jim Schwartz has been exceptional at coordinating defenses and orchestrating defenses, scheming defense for a great many years at this point, the better part of two decades in the NFL and longer longer than that in coaching just in general but this is going to be this is going to be the hallmark of their defense this is going to be something that they have to find ways to improve upon Jeff Simmons cannot be the most double team defensive lineman in the NFL next year it cannot be so we'll get back to that conversation in a little bit but in the meantime Derek Henry's at the podium let's hear from him shall we just working hard as much as I can when I'm out there. And then when I'm not practicing, just taking mental reps. And then when I'm uh, conditioning with a strength and conditioning coach, just working hard to keep my body in shape. And like I said, when I get done with that, just coming back in, um, watching from the sideline, helping the guys, trying to do the best that I can to you know help them with their reps and also taking mental reps as well. How much input do you have on that plan, or do you just – listen to what the training staff says on a day-to-day basis no uh, listen to what the head coach says so you know um, it's the plan that he instilled and you know, i'm just out here trying to work and get, just get better the best way i can been holding the script a lot of play a lot of days too and i think tony even said they've been calling you coach coach Derek, maybe or coach henry whose idea is that to maybe be have the script and how much did that maybe help keep you involved in some of those team periods oh no i'm just uh holding the script uh calling out plays um Trying to be helpful, um, um, letting guys know when their uh, when their rep when their rep is up, and you know just trying to encourage them to go out there and do their best, and also taking a mental rep. But you know just trying to help any way I can, and trying to be involved in practice as much as I can as well. Did that and that Sam Pitt from time to time over the years? How, how does that help your game? What do you what do you like about that? It definitely uh, helps me get in shape, conditioning wise. Um, uh, it's tough running in that sand, but I love it. It's been helping me, and um, it's what's been working for me. So, love doing it. Does it work anything in, in particular? You know, more more so than you might be on the field. Or? Uh, no, it's, it's just you know the sand. Your your feet can get planted because it's so deep, and you know restricting you. I know my legs be burning, and trying to work on quickness. Anything that we do as a running back, as far as drills and things like that, just trying to work on that while we're doing it. I know you a couple of times go to Racy after he's made some plays, kind of encouraging him. What do you like about him, and what do you tell a young guy like that who's, who's doing this for the first time? Yeah, just a uh, great play, um, you know, and a uh, great job. And, you know, it's, continue to make plays is what we're here for, you know, to, you know, get better, compete, um, make plays when they're there. And um, he's made a couple of plays and, you know, just wanted to, you know, tell him good job. Much work in the preseason uh, to get ready for the for the year and, and get any indication at all what your workload might be in, in three games. Um, I'm just I'm ready for whatever really. Um, it's training camp. Um, Got to come out and work. Got to do come come do your job each and every day. So whatever I have to do, you know I'm willing to do. But right now, just focus on what I can do right now. Derek is obviously still early. What have you seen from you know, Todd Downing? 
uh, being the, the offensive coordinator, he's obviously in the building, but now the role, he has the role Arthur had. Just what have you seen from him, and how is he maybe different um, from Arthur? Not really getting to all that, but just want us to get better. Um, you know, want us to take it from the meeting to the field and compete, come out here and compete and get better. Um, challenge the defense and come out here and make plays on receivers, tight ends, running backs, uh, O-line block, throw backs throw. It's really just come out here trying to make plays as an offense and, you know, putting things together, you know, as, as the day goes on. It's day by day, one play at a time, and just getting better every day, competing and wanting to come work and, you know, put plays together. In camp, this league, how much do you admire his ability and desire to sort of stick with it through those times? Um, yeah, I mean, Jeremy's been in the league uh, for a while, and um, he knows what he has to do. It's, it's to grind, and um, you know, and, and that's what he does. He just grinds. He works hard, and um, comes out and um, does his job whenever whenever his name is called. And that's all you can ask for. That's all he tries to do each and every day. Talk out there from national people, local people, whatever that you could be the guy to break 2,000 in consecutive years and all that. Do you embrace that kind of expectation? I mean, do you, is that something in your head you're saying, I want to go for that this year? I think I can, or how do you approach that? Just talk. Just talk. Um, Got to put the work in, and that's what I try to focus on every day. You know, everybody talks, but I'm just focused on me getting better and working hard as much as I can. They, they've had you some in, in the sand pit and things like that. What are some of the benefits of that? What does that do conditioning-wise for you? Oh, yeah, he just, yeah, just asked. Yeah, he just asked that. It's all good. Anything else? Yes. Thanks, Derek. All right, thank y'all. Running back Derek Henry there on the podium, live from Titans training camp here on 104.5 The Zone. You know, Derek, always, always reserved in his comments. We, uh, Interesting, though, to hear his perspective on some of the guys that are coming up behind him and the depth that they have at that position this year. He's uh, he's somebody who is going to have, a obviously, a massive role to play in what they're doing. Derrick Henry, the most important piece, one of the most important pieces, if not the most important piece, of this Titans offense. But the question continues, you know, what do you, what do, you do behind a guy like that? What is Darrington Evans' role in this offense? How does how does uh, how does somebody like Jeremy McNichols, who's been working his way back out onto the practice field, how does he continue to find his role with this team? Something that I think you know, how do they find ways to diversify this offense to do things differently than they've done in years past? Diversify the passing game out of the backfield with all three of those guys, or some combination of them. The uh, Brian Hill, another running back, a very very long running back, and somebody who's his his role is yet to be determined, it seems like, so far out here and, and something that we're going to continue to monitor, that bottom of the roster or that depth, that depth conversation that is going to play itself out in these preseason games. Preseason games, by the way, that start on Friday. We're very excited about that. To have Titans Radio back in action live from Atlanta doing uh, doing the thing that they love to do, doing the thing that they do best, which is create great content for you guys and carrying these games. So we'll learn more about who has these roles to play and who they feel, you know, who they feel comfortable with, at least in this first bit of action. It'd be interesting to see how they kind of stagger the preseason games or how they handle, you know, who actually plays in them, right? Because the third preseason game has always been the one that is must watch out of the preseason games, because that is traditionally when you see the starters take the greatest amount of reps. That's not been the case here in Tennessee, right? The starters play precious few, if if any, in the case of people like Derrick Henry, precious f- few opportunities for them in the preseason. So not something at this point that I think, uh, but I mean, how many roster spots are really, really up for grabs at this point? We're talking about right tackle. We're talking about tight end and really not even that, despite what the unofficial depth chart says about it. Jeff, I still can't get over that. I don't know why I'm so locked in on Jeff Swaim as the starting tight end. Like, who, who has the it's, – it's, I, I want to do my best Stephen A. Smith impression. Who has the temerity, the unmitigated goal to sit here, <laughs> to sit here and lie to my face about, 
about who the starting tight end on this football team is. You, right you did now. say one of your big takeaways was Sombrello as the starting right tackle. Isn't that more of a co starter situation between him and Lamb? It's Sombrello well, slash Lamb. He's, that's they're what not it separate. Says. All, all I know is it's not the person that they drafted to do that job. <laughs> it's not Dylan Ray. But Rayden. nobody expected it to be this early, right? Uh, I mean, in a perfect world. I, I how many times have we talked about the expectation of Dylan Radens being the week one starter at right tackle? I don't know that any of us have had that expectation. I have tried to manage expectations in that way, I think, pretty well. But also, you know, the fact that he's not even listed at that position, I think, is the most concerning. If you are somebody who is going to have major takeaways from an unofficial depth chart, which is not something that we're going to do because it's lying to us. It's lying to my face. I can't respect it. 615-737-1045. Now, Lucas, I don't know if he's up there on your end, but Mike Vrabel has made his way to the podium, so we will hear from the head coach momentarily. I'm sure he'll have many thoughts on the unofficial depth chart and, and who his starting tight end is, despite what this piece of paper says. I I, I can't imagine it's going to be terribly, uh, terribly informative but we will learn about what was accomplished out here at practice and and really the the state of the depth right now I think the offensive line continues to be a bit of a fascination because of how many bodies they don't have right now how many guys they're missing how many guys are on limited reps load management for guys like Taylor Lewan, Roger Saffold Ben Jones how they're kind of trying to make sure that they preserve their health at the utmost so let's hear from the head coach Mike Vrabel's up now Big team announcement. It seems like a big deal. Well, it's early, you know. It's Joe's question. Okay, so we'll get to you in a second. So there. You know, I think that if you'll see some of the rookies, you know, we'd like to ask them to earn the right uh, to to be able to to be in there, whether they're with the second group because of you know an injury or opportunity. Um, you know, we want to make sure that they're earning the right to, to be on this football team, um, just like everybody else. But, um, you know, there's a lot of names here, and there's going to be a lot of different combinations uh, as we work our way through the preseason. There'll be a lot of combinations on Friday um, and, and as we get to our first game. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock into it on what it looks like now. I think we can all anticipate that some of these names will remain uh, as starters for us going into the season. But then, you know, there'll be a lot of other guys that throughout the course of the preseason and games, um, you know, work their way up or work their way down. Like I think that that helped. Yeah, but like Kirk's are not being in a one, for example. I don't want, you know, I mean, there's a lot of personnel packages and things like that. But you you want to, um, you know, some days he'll start, and some days he, some games he, he, he probably, or may not, you know, I'm not sure. How good a step was it uh, to get Taylor and Ty back into team drills today? Well, you know, that return to play, and those are good things. They've been out there. They've been working hard, um, and we need bodies there. And obviously, we need good bodies and good players, and um, so hopefully they'll respond uh, favorably to that work. Um, we'll see how they feel, and um, and then see where they're at in the morning and whether we add on kind of like we have done with Farley at Caleb's gotten, you know, some more work as, as he's been out there and, you know, some other guys that are in that category as well. Do you start having conversations about the preseason game that's coming up, how long you want to play these certain guys, who gets to sit, those sorts of conversations? Who we're having, Who would be having those conversations? Me and you or? You. Yeah, no, I mean, I have a good idea. You know, I, I talked to John about it and, you know, those are the two people that usually decide most of the things that happen as it relates to our football team, uh, have a conversation with our coaches. You know, we'll see how we come out of the, the practice tomorrow. And again, we'll determine that, um, you know, closer to game time. Is the preseason any different this year with three games as opposed to four in years past? I mean, I think every year is just so unique as it relates to the injuries and the numbers of guys that we have and who will have to play, you know, based on you know, other players' availability. and. You know, how guys are performing and how many reps they get in practice. You know, there's a lot of guys that are logging a lot of reps that may have to play a lot in the game. And then some of those guys that are getting a lot of reps may not play as much in the game. So I think every every game and each week in a preseason is unique. Um, you know, we want to come out and, and be the, the most prepared that we can be, but also um, very conscious of the, the health of the football team and, 
you know, and all those opportunities that we get to, to improve, you know, as it relates to some young guys or some guys that are new to our program. Josh Reynolds is as far as getting integrated into the offense. Uh, what are some of the expect expectations that you may have this uh, preseason? Well, again, we talk about expectations, and the expectations are the same for for every player and every coach. And you know, the coaches would be to you know um, try to teach, develop, and, and eventually inspire the players to to do a better job. And the player's job is. You know, to know what to do and, and be able to execute, play fast and aggressive. Um, and Josh was doing that, had some time off, um, and has started to work himself back in there. So we'll con you know, continue to see where he's been. And, and again, he started off, had, had a really nice couple of days, um, you know, and then no fault to his own. He, you know, something happens and he has to, you know, be out a few days. But I, I like his professionalism. I think he's locked into the meetings. I hear him communicate. He doesn't have a whole lot of mental errors. And so that's a that's a good start uh, as far as you know playing receiver. Now you got to go out there and, and get open and catch the ball. Mike, you had a, a little bit of a coaching moment with uh, Caleb Farley um, in in 11s today. Just what have you kind of seen from him generally in, in his first two days of, of team stuff? I mean, he's just got a lot of work to do, and you know, he's whatever made a mistake or didn't do something great, and kind of stood there or laid on the ground. And I just said that's not how we're gonna. Do it, you know. I mean, there's going to be a lot of mistakes that happen through the course of the game, you know. But we're going to go finish, and we're going to find somebody to cover, or find somebody to tackle, or or finish the play. Any braces for, for offensive linemen when you're in pads? How much of a security blanket you feel like that provides? And I think, you know, we wouldn't do it if we didn't think that it provided some sort of security blanket. You know, we try to do the best that we can to stay up and practice fast, um, continuing to remind them to stay up when guys go down. Or guys are on the ground, and we want to we want to be able to do that. Um, I, I hope that it helps. Some, you know, I mean, we we wouldn't make them do it if we didn't feel like it helped. Um, you know, so all we can do is try to practice and 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 be as coordinated as we possibly can, making sure everybody's going in the same direction, everybody's staying on their feet you know, to the ground. I, I try to do my best to coach that on both sides, and um, you know, focus on the football team and remind a defensive guy that. You know, we're not taking cheap shots or an offensive guy. We're not taking cheap shots or, you know, we got to do our best to stay up to try to keep, you know, get something done out there, but, but obviously uh, do it as, as fast and as healthy as we can. You had no preseason games and how you went into the season. Did that change at all your mindset of how do you view preseason game work for guys and how you might approach this season? Well, I think the thing we thought about last year was, you know, as you work your way towards a game and after a game, there's some time off, right? There's some some lag time. You know, Thursday is going to be a travel day, Friday is going to be a game, and Saturday is going to be a day off. So, um, last year our focus was making sure that we just didn't practice all the way through those days and you know get the mileage or the volume up. And I thought that Frank and I and Todd and everybody involved with that tried to you know do a good job there. And then we'll kind of see where we're at. You know, here in the next couple of days, we'll have a call it tomorrow and, you know, see guys just play and execute without a script. Um, you know, and then we have to go through some, you know, a lot of situational stuff on Wednesday, you know, before our first game, you know, pregame stuff. And then obviously situations that may come up in the game that, um, you know, hopefully if we, we continue to rep them as they go down in the course of the game, if we get one in the season, you know, we'll be able to execute it and, and hopefully use it to our advantage. Do you value the reps within the game more or less not having it last year than having it? Well, we'll see after Atlanta. You know, I mean, obviously, any, time, any chance you have to go out there to compete against somebody else in a, in a game, in a competition setting, and, and tackle and, and finish and block and, you know, have a penalty, the sting of a penalty actually affect the team. You know, we were in two-point play today, and we jumped off side, or we fall started, and, you know, Unless it was the end of the game, we would come back to the 20 and you know kick the extra point. So that's what we did. It's good that the officials were here. It's great. You know, hopefully those meetings go well with the players and they can continue to communicate what their mechanisms are, what they're looking at, uh, and how they officiate a game, so that our players can use all that information, you know, to go out there and help them do their job. Language and sense of urgency at the end of game stuff you didn't seem happy with. Get the message. Why, 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 why should I? You know, what I mean, we got to compete. You know, what I mean, we've had, you know, you know, we had games last year where we didn't.
play at the early part of the game like we expected to. Cleveland, Pittsburgh. But the thing that I was most proud of was that you have two choices in, at a halftime. You know, you can go out there and, you know, lay down uh, or you can compete and, and see what happens. And, you know, we missed a kick ultimately in Pittsburgh and, you know, Cleveland, we, we we came back and at least we're, we're competitive. And so that's that's what I'm trying to focus on is just competing, you know, try to show them, you know, um, you know, Gabe Stevenson. You know, there's eight seconds left and you're down. I mean, and normally in wrestling, like anybody that watches wrestling, like that match is, is over. You know, 99 times out of 100, they're just going to stall you out and, you know. But he kept fighting, competing, and found a way to win with, with .4 seconds or whatever he did. So that's the mindset. You know, it's like, okay, maybe you lose, but... But you got to find out. You got to go compete as hard as you can. And if you if you do indeed lose, then we got to come back and you know fix the stuff. But you know we will and we'll coach it. And, and I you know guys are tired and long practice and it's hot and there's a million excuses. But you know we're just looking for guys to try to go win a game in that situation. Your approach with Derek. Sign. Don't prolong this thing any longer with Derek science and how much does it feel like will there be a day you just walk in here look at him and say you know what we're gonna we're gonna ramp it up today probably not I mean we try to communicate that you know before I mean but there's a plan I mean there's a lot of science and there's things you know he'll have to get some work um, as, as we go through here closer to the season um, and he does get a little bit you know I mean in a controlled um, drill half line drill with with some run and some pass that you know less bodies and you know, pretty, um, pretty basic look, right? So that we can just get him a little bit of tracks or you know, a little bit of speed. So, um, you know, we'll just continue with the plan and always try to communicate with the players. From last year's draft class, this year, you know, with the full off season and so forth, are you seeing more? You know, I mean, I think some guys have improved. You know, I mean, I do. I like. I'm not going to compare whatever we looked like last year at this time with the rookies and that. I don't. One, I probably couldn't tell you, um, but I have seen some improvement. You know, I think some guys that were maybe they made some mistakes early on um, have done and, and have eliminated some of those mistakes. Maybe have gotten better in some of the special teams techniques that maybe they either didn't play or they weren't accustomed to uh, at the college game. You know, so we'll just keep plowing along with them and put them out there on Friday and you know have them ready to go and see how they respond. Uh, for Luke Fickle, I know he's a close friend of yours. What, what would you make of the progression of, of his uh, coaching career so far? Well, I mean, Luke was the best man at my wedding. He was my host when I got to Ohio State. You know, one of my best friends. You know, and I think that as he, you know, worked his way through Ohio State, he had a lot of opportunities. You know, to go other places, um, and you know, he always did what was best for for his family. And, and him, and he's in you know, Ohio State, and he stayed there. And then I think when he had an opportunity, you know, you've seen what he's been able to do with uh, the University of Cincinnati and the type of program that he's built, um, the type of coaches that he has there, and then obviously the type of players um, in recruiting that he's brought on there. And I think that you know Luke is obviously, um, you know, a fantastic coach, great friend, and you know somebody that I you know rely on to to talk to and. You know, as he starts camp and I start camp and we, you know, talk about whatever's going on each day. And, you know, so he'll be able to, you know, hopefully build a great, great program there like he has been. Practice Wednesday, you just going to simulate sort of the whole Atlanta game day with that? Is that the thinking behind that time? Yep. Show up and we'll find out. It's like kickers, punter, you know what I mean? That stuff. Here we go, individual here, seven on seven team, and then we'll have some practice, you know, and then it'll be a lot of those, you know, one or two time situations that, that you want to cover, you know, that we have to cover. Day, in the day, we'll well, yeah, that's the reason why. And I, I get what your question was is, you know, we want to be able to, to meet on it, watch TV copy of it, show tape of it, you know, walk through it. Um, so that they, they understand why we would be doing that situation, what that last play may be, what it may look like, um, you know, what, what taking a safety would look like on, on the punt team or how much time comes off the clock when you onside kick it and, and you recover it, which is none. 
if it's an immediate recovery or how much time comes off if you bunt it to them and they touch it and they recover it. One sec. Well, all those little things that, you know, gives us an opportunity to teach and then come out here and walk through. Okay, guys. Situational practice, it sounds like, is in store for us on Wednesday. Spicy. Been waiting for that one for a while. We'll come back. And we will react to what the head coach had to say. Get into your phone calls as well. 615-737-1045. I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. Inside and outside the locker room, we got you covered with the best Titans training camp coverage. Your home for Titans football. And flagship for Titans radio. 104.5 The Zone.
Hopper. Mike Brable, Derek Henry just wrapped up their sessions at the podium. Taking you through the rest of the way. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in on the conversation. If you'd like, 615-737-1045. So a couple of things to pull from Brable's press conference that Lucas is endeavoring right now, but an observation that I want to bring up around this that happened at camp today. Uh, Caleb Farley, who is going through, by the way, practice three practices in a row for Bud Dupree off the physically unable to perform list. That's a big deal. Caleb Farley participating in all of those practices since returning from non-football injury list in to varying degrees, right? There's load management. If you want to call it that there's staggering of their workloads, depending on the player and their individual situation. It's, it's good to see if you are someone who is focused on the most important thing with this football team, which is health at the forefront, always health at the forefront. I don't care how many days Julio Jones practices or does not practice. I don't care how many times I see Taylor Lewan out there in 11 on 11. I just don't. I care that they can play on Sundays if I'm a Titans fan and certainly as a media member because they are more fun players to watch than the alternative. So we would prefer to see them out there. Um, that is my, that is my level investment. How much, how can you keep me from wanting to change the channel the most? Because I have no ability to change the channel in the press box, as most of you do. You're just getting football stuck into your veins. I, that's that's all NFL Red Zone is. It's just hero, heroin for football fans. They just they just straight they just mainline it right into uh, right into your uh, right between if if you're somebody who uses too many veins, right between your fingers is where the the worst of the addicts goes. For those of you who need tips, <laughs> Kirby's Kirby's pointing at his toes for me. Out here, that's that's what that's Lucas. That's what my experience has been like at training camp. It's Kirby, Kirby uh, regaling me, which is why I'm, this is my favorite part of doing remotes. It's really the only thing I like about doing remotes is I get to hang out with Kirby for three hours and get regaled with stories of the past and his athletic achievements, and then you know where best to stick a needle. <laughs> Kirby Tommy had to break into a car once at a remote. It's it's just you, I learn so much more from Kirby Allen Kirby than I do on a day to day basis. New every day. It's an indictment of me. 615-737-1045. But Caleb Farley going through practices, every practice since his return off NFI to varying degrees. But today it was a, a very coachable moment or a very important coaching moment for the rookie first-round cornerback. So it was Christian, remind me, Christian, who's out here keeping tabs on these things for us, was it 7-on-7 seven seven or 11-on-11 11 11 this took place? 11-on-11. 11 11. So full squad work throughs at this point. Now, Caleb Farley is obviously in coverage. Logan Woodside is the quarterback. Logan Woodside is trying to find a play to make in the coverage. The coverage is not there. The coverage is such that he can't find a throw. So he begins to scramble. Now, Caleb Farley apparently trips over himself, but instead of jumping back up, popping back up and finishing through the play or, you know, trying to figure out where best he can make himself useful, he remains on the ground because he's just going to, not I don't, taking that rep off is probably not a fair assessment, but he's just not getting back up in the middle of the play. And so Woodside scrambles right towards him and, and makes a, uh, a, meaning, a meaningful gain is probably not fair. Logan Woodside, uh, mobility, not, not a tool, not a tool quite yet. He's got a little bit of something, but I think he thinks he's got more than he actually does. Anyway, so at that point, he gets up. Caleb Farley doesn't, doesn't necessarily know what's going on in the play, doesn't know where to be. He's, he looks a bit disoriented. And so Vrabel kind of throws him off the practice field. So this was Mike Vrabel at the podium kind of answering a question about what kind of a teaching moment that was. I mean, he's just got a lot of work to do. And, you know, he's whatever made a mistake or didn't do something great and kind of stood there or laid on the ground. And I just said, that's not how we're going to do it. You know, I mean, there's going to be a lot of mistakes that happen through the course of the game. You know, but we're going to go finish, and we're going to find somebody to cover or find somebody to tackle or, or finish the play. So basically, fall down, but get back up. You can fall down. You can have a missed assignment. You can make a mistake, but don't just sit there. Don't lay there. Finish through. Even if you don't know where you're supposed to be finishing through to, just find somewhere to finish. Don't lay there. Because this is something that came up later in the press conference as well with Rabel, where... He's talking about, you know, the games going back to last season, games like Pittsburgh and Cleveland specifically, the two that he cited, where they're just getting their asses kicked in the first half of those games between the Browns and the Steelers. 
They they got nothing. They got nothing for Baker Mayfield. They got nothing for the Browns run game. They got nothing for Ben Roethlisberger just absolutely massacring Ty Smith. Not even in the first half. He got Ty Smith benched, Roethlisberger did, after the first drive. And they yank him out of there. So those two games, Steelers and Browns, early leads. Certainly at half. But Vrabel was saying, you know, despite how the final result of those two games played out, the thing that we look for in those moments, and the thing that John Robinson has talked about in his scouting, is that in a blowout, when when the odds are stacked against you, what is your finish? What is your level of effort? How how invested are you? Are you just laying down, basically? That moment with Caleb Farley today is kind of emblematic of what they're looking to coach them against. You can have the odds stacked against you. You can do things that put yourself in the bad position in the first half of a game, as they did against Cleveland, as they did against Pittsburgh. But how you come out at the half and rebound and try and fight and make yourself competitive, as they did in both of those games, even if they ended up missing a kick to send it to overtime, potentially against the Steelers, Goskowski did, and then in Cleveland, uh, having the game just too far out of their grasp because they put 30 points on the Titans in the first half of that game. These are the kind of moments that they're teaching and coaching young players coming into this program, into this system, because that is something that is a trait, that is a tool that they will need to survive, certainly an extended regular season like the one that we will have this year. We will wrap up this show. Coming up next, we will do the polls. We are also going to play you a clip of who I contend is the most famous Titans fan because this was not somebody who I would have guessed. He's playing the NFL opener between the Buccaneers and is it the Cowboys? Is the Bucks cowboys opener? Is that really what we're doing on Thursday Night Football? That is such a, that's a, such a ratings grab that they're doing. I respect the hell out of it. But we will tell you who the most famous Titans fan is, and then we will laugh at it because I think it's hilarious. Coming up next, I'm Buck Rising. This is 104.5 The Zone. The NFL preseason is finally here, and the Titans pay an early visit to Julio Jones' former team, the Atlanta Falcons. Mike Keith and Coach Mack have the kickoff Friday night at 6. Finger roll! Touchdown, Titans! On your home for Titans football and flagship for Titans radio, 104.5 The Zone.
at some point since he's out here with me. Many stories that Kirby Allen Kirby has to tell the listening audience. We will wrap up the show with polls momentarily. Put this thing in the books. If you missed any of today's show, check out the podcast. Check out the podcast, uh, The Buck Rising Show, in your favorite podcast app. Also, the install with Greg Cosell coming later this week on Wednesday. We're going to do a deep dive on Ryan Tannehill, so you are not going to want to miss a moment of that. And a 615 Sessions podcast coming your way tomorrow in your A to Z Sports podcast network feed. It'll be me. It'll be Teron Davenport of ESPN and Corey Curtis from News 2. So subscribe, rate, and review. If you have questions for the group to answer, you can send them to my Instagram DMs, at Buck Rising, R-E-I-S-I-N-G. We would be happy to answer them for you there. Last call for those, because the podcast tapes in about an hour. So we ain't going to wait around. Get them in there. Uh, before we get to the polls, I saw something over the weekend that made me laugh out loud, and I wanted to make sure we find a way to get it in. Lucas, who's the most famous Titans fan? I have no idea. Well, I, I, no, I, I, think, I, I really I think, don't know. Well, we I, it always makes me laugh every time they wish a happy birthday from the team account to some, like, obscure celebrity that you've never heard of or had, like, a bit part in, in like, 90210 or something like that. Or, you know, it's it's an always sunny in Philadelphia character, but it's, like, a fringe character that you didn't really realize was a mainstream actor. They, there's just guys guys and, and gals like that who you, you just never really, you know, I don't necessarily get it, but I was watching the NFL Network's coverage the other day of, you know, week one. It's rapidly approaching. This is the first Monday, by the way, without Titans football until next year. Congratulations. We've made it. We've made it to preseason week number one. There will be, well, outside of the bye week, but, you know, we don't got to get bogged down with that. So I was watching NFL Network's coverage of, of their leading up to the proceedings, all the glitz and glamour, the... Uh, the red carpet rollout that will be Buccaneers versus the Cowboys, and the musical act that's the musical act that's playing the opener is a Titans fan, and it made me laugh out loud. Lucas, do we have that audio before we tell the audience who it is? Go ahead. Oh, he's not ready. It's a big moment for me. I, I've never done anything really with um, the the NFL. I came over to America properly and moved here in 2013 moved to Nashville, I went to Walmart and I bought some pajamas and I was like, what's this symbol? And I found out the symbol was the Tennessee Titans and I've been a Titans fan ever since. That is Ed Sheeran. <laughs> what's this symbol? <laughs> Who bought Titans pajama pants at a Walmart when he first came to America. Now he's a Titans fan. So shout Kirby, to Kirby. <laughs> Kirby, you should have seen him all, all but shake his fist when, he said, when, the, when the voice said, when I moved to America proper. And he said, who is there, Ed Sheeran? Just spat it out at me from the side. Yes, Ed Sheeran. I think I, you would have to go with Ed Sheeran as the most famous Titans fan, even though Kirby Allen Kirby doesn't know him. I don't think that's an indictment of Ed Sheeran. I think that's an indictment of Kirby. I, they, don't put, they don't put as many spotlights on, like, celebrities at Titans games as, say, the Preds do. Well, yeah, but it's easier to do. And, and listen, by the way, when the Preds take over Nissan Stadium for that stadium series, if the Preds do a better job in in-arena experience than the Titans do, then... <laughs> Then some heads rightfully should roll at that point because that is not – you can no longer excuse, use the excuse of 20,000 in, in a closed arena as opposed to a 70,000-seat open-air stadium. That will not be an excuse that flies any longer if the Preds do a better job in-game than the Titans do. We'll, do. we'll talk about that at a later time. I just love that Walmart is how Ed Sheeran became a Titans fan. It's fitting. Give me some polls. Stop the count. Stop the count. The polls have closed and the votes have been tallied. Now, here's your favorite Buck Rising Show correspondent, Lucas Polzika. Who is the most famous Titans fan? Luke Warsham replies and says, at Buck Rising. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate him. <laughs> many, many give a shout out to the late Matt Neely. Yeah, Neely's a good one. Um, Hang TN, Hang TN Twitter account. Hang Rep ten, Hang you ten, Billy. <laughs> Hang ten replies with a picture of a T-shirt with Britney Spears on it, wearing a Javon Kirst jersey. Right, which they haven't legally got gotten cleared. I heard, I saw them tweeting back at people in my mentions asking for where they could buy the Britney Spears, <laughs> Britney Spears Javon Kirst T-shirt, and they said, "Well, understandably, Britney's legal team is working on some stuff right now, so they can't necessarily get back to us in terms of clearance for merchandise sales. They try to free her from a 13-year conservatorship." 
Um, <laughs> Unbelievable. Bruno Jones replies with a great photo of Dwayne The Rock Johnson in a 99 Titans jersey where what? allegedly The Rock did a few hype videos at the on the Jumbotron when it was Adelphia Coliseum. That would be cool. I mean, listen, he's he's probably the toughest get out there right now. He's the highest grossing actor in Hollywood, which is insane to me because all his movies stink. But, but uh, yeah, Dwayne The Rock Johnson would be a good one. He he would probably beat out Ed Sheeran, especially since he's been absorbed by the Fast and Furious franchise that continues to just create these mutations of movies. Never ending. Dan says the pineapple dude that is loyally at every game dressed like No, but pineapple. he's not the pineapple dude anymore. Oh, what is he? He's, oh, he's not a pineapple. Marcus Mariota is no longer with oh, the team. What, so the pineapple is no something longer. Last season, what was he? I mean, I don't know what you can't. There is nothing symbolic, fruit wise, that you can find for for Ryan Tannehill. Unless and, you, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you make that work. But ben Patton. This is the last one with a screenshot of that uh, picture of Snoop Dogg in the Eddie George jersey. That's a that's a good one. Yeah. Snoop Snoop international renown. Uh, I would say though that uh, Snoop Dogg uh, declares his allegiances for like. 17 teams, yeah. though. Yeah, like Drake. And um, he's been he's been great with Kevin Hart on the NBC Olympic coverage, by the way. We, yeah, so some of the stuff where they were doing equestrian was pretty good. Uh, did, did get some replies to come in on what was your favorite part of the Music City Grand Prix. Uh, no, it's too late. It's too late. They, too late they had that? their opportunity, and then we, no, I mean, we can do some of the responses, but that being the only, of all the stupid stuff we put on my Twitter account. I know. You put on my Twitter account between 9 and 1 on weekdays. That's the only poll that we had not gotten a response to an hour into the show. That is shocking to me. Seth Clark says, I do not watch racing of any kind. Having said that, I thought it was really cool to see how they race those cars and to see it in our town. Very, very cool. Watched more than I ever thought I would watch, and I would watch again. Okay. That's good. I think I think that's probably, I don't know, it would, probably not consensus from the audience because I think a lot of, yeah, it's got a lot, of, a lot of tweets like, I'd rather watch paint dry. Okay, then go watch paint dry. I don't care what you're watching. Uh, if you're not watching this, I'm not de- demanding that you watch this. I'm just ge- generally asking people in Nashville how they feel about this being an experience in their city, which I think is a cool one. Yeah, I get 200 miles per hour. Too slow for some people. Yeah, it's just not fast enough pace. for you. Yes, paint dry to a to a car uh, to a. Uh, it's not even a car. It's a rocket ship ripping <laughs> down Koreans' vets at 200 miles an hour. Too slow. Who is the Titans' best defensive player? Uh, Crazy Pellet says Jayon Brown. He's the Mike of the defensive front and was improving every game last year before the injury. Yeah, but he didn't start good. Like, he was improving every game last year because he was not good at the start of the season. That's probably, I mean, and Jay, Jay, I've been I've been a very, very loud Jayon advocate since he got, like, extended playing time as a rookie. Um, but last year was not the start of his season. He was starting to round into form. They're correct in that. But when his elbow blew up in Baltimore, I mean... That was not something that, that was not something, it was not a strong start to the season in a way that we would have accustomed the name Jayon Brown to have. Matt says, I'm a believer in Bayard, but Big Jeff is a game changer. A lot of people saying Big Jeff Simmons. Uh, and he was great today. So go check out that interview if you want to, uh, if you want to get a little extra Big Jeff in your life. There's a lot of him to go around. That's going to do it for us today. I'm out here tomorrow, I assume, right? This, this, the, the training camp never ends. Kirby is saying, yes, it's a different week because it's actual game week. Preseason, though it may be, we're excited about it. And the conversation is going to continue. Blaine and Mickey is there up next. By any means necessary. By any means necessary. Defense, scoring, taking people out, whatever it is, it's on. You got to win, and it's going down. This 3HL with Brent Doherty, Don Davenport, and Ron Slay. This afternoon, starting at 3, 104.5.